Labas rytas. Good morning, colleagues and friends. Welcome everyone this morning. Joining us in person, we have here in our hall some colleagues and online at the Baltic Musicological Conference Music and Change. Two main organizers of this conference, my colleague Rima Pavilonine and me, Ruta Stanevichute, were looking forward very much to meet you in Vilnius. Pre-conference time was really challenging for us. So we really would like to uh, thank all of you for adaptation and support in this uh, preparation time. In this pandemic situation, it was very important to have uh, support of our colleagues, co-organizers, keynotes, speakers, and all you who joined us. Our program committee, and I'd like to name the, uh, my colleagues, Malgozhata Janitska Slish, Kevin Karnes, Olga Manulkina, Lina Lavitskaita Martinelli, Rima Povilonini, Peter Schmelz, Ivona Sovinska, Frutru, and me, all of us has, have done a lot for this event, and I would like really to, to thank you very much. This year, Baltic Conference aims to explore the tra a transformative power of music in uh, processes of liberation and change. The thematic inspiration for this conference uh, comes from our collaboration with a joint polish lithuanian project, Music of Change, Cultural Expression of Liberation in Lithuanian and Polish Music. So I'm thankful for uh, my Polish colleagues, co-organizers of this event, for deep involvement, and uh, especially my co-chair, Malgozhata Janitska Slysh, and coordinator from Polish side, Ivona. Thank you, I see you on my uh, laptop. Uh, for institutional and financial support, I would like to thank musicological section of Lithuanian Composers Union, and the chair of the section will speak soon, Lina Navitskaita Martinelli. Also, Lithu Lithuanian Research Council, Lithuanian Council for Culture, and uh, of course, our Lithuanian Academy of Music and PhD. At last but not least, my deepest appreciation goes to Rima. She did excellent work for all of us, and please applaud for her. So, and now I'm giving the voice to Lina Navitskaita Martinelli, Chair of Lithuania, uh, Musicological Section of the Lithuanian Composers Union. Thank you, Ruta, and good morning, dear colleagues, both those whom I'm glad to see here in this conference hall, and those who are watching us online and those who will still join us during these three days. I cannot express my happiness that we actually are in a conference. Any conference at this point is a joy. I must say that my colleagues were very courageous Nearly any event that was scheduled for this period was actually canceled. And I was afraid that this event would be canceled too, but so here we are. And what we have is a hybrid conference, so to say. So I invite all of us to take this not as a downside, but as an opportunity to see it as something that welcomes even more researchers than those who could have been here in, in person, but also all of those over the world who can join us now and watch our talks, papers, keynotes, and discussions online. Uh, so during these three days, we are going to discuss the concept of change in its broadest sense. Of course, the 1990s were a major threshold for the Baltic states, and as we shall see also for the rest of the world in quite a few ways. So we are not going to talk only about the political changes and music within those political changes in the Baltic states. We are going to discuss a change in terms of genre, in terms of technologies, in terms of culture, politics, uh, musical developments, and so on. And... Uh, 
I wish you all inspiration, open-mindedness, and the technical, the smooth as possible technical run in all this. Uh, perhaps a little uh, on the Baltic conferences as such. So here we already have the 47th uh, Baltic conference, which brings even more joy that this tradition is running. And we have colleagues who've been here from the very beginning, from the dawn of times of the Baltic Musicological Conferences. And we hope that no pandemic will be able to stop them running the, until the 50th and the 100th conference of the Baltic Musicological Conferences. So I welcome you on the behalf of the Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre and the Lithuanian Composers Union. And I wish you wonderful three days with us. Thank you, Lina, very much for your address. And now it is a privilege to invite our first keynote speaker, Professor Gintotas Majekis, philosopher, anthropologist, and social activist, head of a, a Center for Social and um, Social and Political Critics at uh, Vidotas Magnum. University in Konas, and title of this uh, keynote lecture is Dialectives of Music and Popular Revolutions, Lithuania, Ukraine, and Belarus. Before he will start, I just uh, shortly remember that uh, uh, Gindotas has published numerous articles and monographs on uh, critique of symbolic thinking and functions, postmodern anthropology, critique of the contemporary creative industries and comparative analysis of discourses and societies in the uh, society of spectacle. So, so please. Thank you, Ruta, for uh, invitation. And um, I'm ready for my reading. Actually, I'm a philosopher and I'm working in the uh, area of uh, critical theory. Uh, one of the topics of uh, critical theory, uh, which is interesting for me, is uh, music uh, and uh, propaganda and music and in the period of rebellions and revolutions. And I, in previous my um, uh, presentations, I I spoke about <clears throat> uh, yeah, about uh, periods of uh, um, uh, music in uh, Lithuanian societies. It's uh, uh, 1988, 90, uh, 90. Then about especially about uh, Ukrainian Euromaidan, Euromaidan 2013, 2014, and a little bit later, and how it was related with informational warfare. And today, a little bit would like to de to devote my uh, report to the events in Belarus as well, compare with Lithuanians and uh, um, Ukrainians. And now on the uh, top, on the desktop, you uh, see uh, my uh, picture where you see actually that um, a phot photography from uh, the uh, uh, holiday festival of songs, the Nuschwind uh, in 1988 in Vilnius. Uh, uh, in Vilnius, then uh, this is important stage, and it was everything is organized the Soviet time, and as well uh, Lithuanian symbolics, and uh, many of uh, participants think um, and items of uh, independent items of uh, uh, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia in this. I'm maybe one of the first time, and in the students' uh, festival Gaudiamus in the same year. Uh, the other stage, uh, which you see, it's a uh, major stage on Ukrainian Kiev, uh, Euromaidan, uh, Slava Ukraine, and uh, I a little bit participated in this one event, and the stage was uh, quite uh, quite important. Actually, there was two stages, uh, not one. This is major, and the other smaller, and that's uh, even micro stages everywhere. And uh, the third uh, photo, you see that so-called uh, uh, Red Church, uh, Catholic Red Church in the center of Minsk, uh, where this area square became the place uh, for uh, spontaneous stages of uh, different songs and uh, dances. And um, uh, my, But I would like to... Uh, 
to consider all these uh, events from uh, Adornian uh, pers pers perspective, from the perspective of Theodor Adorno and his uh, negative uh, dialectics. And you, uh, you remember that he was quite quite skeptical about all these popular uh, revolutionary events and at the end of his life he has he had even conflicts with the students uh, who participated in protest of 68 68s uh, but in, in another way he uh, criticized a lot of um, this popular music uh, uh, but it's not so simple. I would like to show you that it's not so simple. If you will, you will check uh, his uh, considerations in the books of sociology of music, aesthetics and negative dialectics, which I will use mostly. You will find that he was quite, uh, uh, quite uh, skeptical from the one side and uh, uh, ambiguous, I would say, uh, when he spoke about uh, music in a revolutionary time. Just take uh, that concept uh, revolution and check uh, the texts and you will see that it's not so simple when we are talking about popular music. So, uh, 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 however, in any way, uh, I need to involve a few concepts. The first is uh, related, how to relate on, related with uh, the philosophy of Wilhelm von Humboldt and his um, concept of inner Sprachform. Uh, inner Sprachform, uh, this is inner form of language and how this one topic could be used for the uh, concept of notion of music or begriff der music. The concept begrip in Hegelian sense were used for, for a long time. And I know that contemporary post-structuralists uh, don't like this one uh, begrip, uh, the notion, especially in Hegelian sense, and try to use completely different concepts, uh, for example, signifiers or empty signifiers or on some wide com uh, completed signifiers, socially completed signifiers, or gender completed uh, signifiers. And this is uh, uh, absolutely different approach uh, than uh, Adorno used. Adorno is some, somewhere between. Uh, from the one side, he, uh, he uh, uh, doesn't uh, believe uh, the old uh, philosophy, Hegelian philosophy of uh, the notion, dialectics of notion, dial and, uh, dialectics of uh, big grief. And uh, from the other side, he uh, uh, doesn't use, he doesn't uh, use uh, the concept of signifiers, and he is not participant or the uh, philosopher of post-structuralism. Post so uh, from, uh, how, how, he's, how he solved this uh, problem, um, uh, very specific problem, which I later uh, will mention why it's specific, because the, the teleology of uh, the notion, the teleology of uh, the begrief, and uh, in order to escape from this uh, the the teleology, he he used uh, he used the uh, negative approach on negative dialectics, which means uh, skeptical, very skeptical and critical consideration of previous uh, theories uh, about um, the notion. But from the other side, it uh, doesn't mean complete uh, rejection on complete negation of previous theory. This is very specific uh, approach, negative dialectical method approach, which I later a uh, little bit uh, develop. I will a uh, little bit develop. Then, uh, 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 in, in another way, the other concept which is impossible, which, which is very important for uh, Adorno is Auschwitz. You remember about it, that's uh, the poetry, how, it's po how poetry is possible after Auschwitz, his, his question. And his answer was uh, very standard that any fiction about Auschwitz is impossible. Any fiction about Auschwitz is impossible uh, from the one side, and the others uh, who try to answer uh, uh, to the uh, to Adorno's uh, challenge, uh, the uh, answer is that all testimonies about Auschwitz is fictions. That from the one side versus you see from the one side is any uh, fiction is impossible about Auschwitz. From the other side, all testimonies, all stories about Auschwitz are fictions. You know that's uh, paradox, uh, uh, paradox element. 
and uh, 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 Adorno invited to think uh, this um, uh, uh, dial dialectical approach in critical way, skeptical and critical way. He considered that skepticism and irony are some sort of reflection or self-reflection. -refle that is important in, in order not to follow uh, standard schematism or standard cliché and to, to think uh, by the uh, contradictions, it's normal for dialectical approach, but for critical approach, it means that after the, after the uh, contradictions, you don't need to make a general conclusion or synthesis. He negated uh, Hegelian synthesis as a, some a solution, and he considered that the negation and irony is the solution uh, in, is the solution. So, but a little bit back to the Humboldt. There are many of uh, authors, uh, researchers who compare Humboldt and uh, Adorno, that Humboldt, some concepts of Humboldt could help us to understand the processes in language, music, and in art forms. And um, I would like to remember that uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, he uh, separated, when he spoke about uh, inner Sprachform, he separated so-called work or ergon, that means uh, work or product, 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 and activity or tatikkeit or in, in anti-Greek energeia, uh, energeia, which means that our language in larger sense is not about only speech, this is as well uh, music language or uh, language of uh, pictures, uh, you know, or cinema language uh, in larger sense, that uh, it means that uh, uh, our, our uh, spiritual expression exists between verke or uh, product, some conclusion, expression, and the energia, which means, which in involves as well empathy and intuition, empathy, intuition, or if you would like Dionysian, uh, Dionysian energy, Dionysian energy. And um, energy as intuition uh, is that some kind of uh, Intuition demands uh, new and new borders or attempts of institutional institution, institutionalization. Cornelius Castoriadis imagined institution of society. He wrote a book about this energia yeah, and how it, is, it could be solved by institution. But in a way, it both of them and Adorno uh, and uh, Cornelius Castoriadis separately, uh, they are peers. Um, they were peers, uh, they separately uh, considered that these institutions are not stable, but always in dynamics, in the development, and music institution, music as an institution as well is in uh, dialectical, in, in dialectical uh, development. So this is an uh, urgently important question when we are talking about energia, is the concept of intuition and from the other side that attempt uh, of work or if you would like attempt uh, some strengths uh, str strength to think or power to think or if you would like uh, in Nietzschean sense uh, uh, which, which means that all you need always feel that your strengths your power if you do conclusion be, 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 without your work without any of your attempt and work, without any strength or uh, uh, energy, if you uh, got your conclusions or understand it immediately, it means that uh, you use some kind of cliche or mechanical reproduction of art, which, which was later developed by uh, 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 Walter, uh, Walter Benjamin. But uh, in any way, uh, in, in any way, uh, what is important as well for Marcuse, the friend of Adorno, Herbert Marcuse and Theodor Adorno, it's separation between, between intellect 
and uh, the mind, or between Verstand and Vernunft, which uh, only for mind and Vernunft could be revolutionary, and intellect is already involved in bureaucratic, or if you like, nomenclature uh, solutions. Uh, Verstand, or intellect, always uses um, different uh, transcendental or a priori schemes, schemes, or cliches, or ready uh, solutions, or a ready experience. So uh, when you're in and Nietzsche wrote as well, when you are going to the concert, if you know uh, that uh, the all moments which will sound uh, what you need to listen, if you have uh, the schema and cliche how to listen to music, it means you are on the pressing of uh, persuasion and the pressing maybe or, or of propaganda, but you because you don't uh, do your uh, work, you don't show your strengths, power, and activity. And when we are talking about in uh, uh, so-called uh, creative industries or cultural industries from uh, dialectics of enlightenment of Adorno, we need to remember this one. Um, and, uh, this one. Uh, a separation or differences between schematic uh, a, a perception, schematic uh, understanding, and uh, uh, which, which is different from the work of understanding, from the work of understanding in unclear and unclear situation. The work of understanding in unclear situation always involved the necessity of intuition. However, this is the big problem because Adorno wrote uh, a lot of critiques about intuition. He always criticized musical in intuition and he said that is all the, the concept of intu intuitability, intu intuitability, a monument to old fashioned aesthetic hedonism this is a quote from uh, from Adorno. This uh, what does it mean intuition? It's monument for old-fashioned aesthetic hedonism, and later he called this is petit bourgeois uh, uh, approach, you know, or uncritical approach, and he criticized this. Uh, this is uh, uh, pure intuitability of artwork uh, hides from critical observation, the complex social, political, economical, communicative uh, mediation. He highly criticized the theory of uh, intuition. But stop and listen here. What, what is very uh, important about negative dialectics in this moment. Negative dialectics are very similar to the uh, dialectics of so-called left or um, uh, left uh, Hegelians, uh, or young Hegelians, left and young Hegelians like uh, Moshe Mendelssohn or uh, Moses Mendelssohn or Karl uh, Marx or, uh, or the others. Uh, 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 what is important here that's, uh, uh, that the description of negative dialectics, if you don't have necessary concept, you could use old concepts, but in negative way. This is the form, one of the formal of negative dialectics. You could take for your, uh, for your uh, needs some old concept, but you, but you, in this way, in order not to do mistakes, you need not to present the old concept in the positive way, not to use in the positive way, but to criticize this concept into negative way without proposing the other concept, without proposing of the other concept. It means, it means that uh, old, in this one way, you could use old, uh, uh, terms, old concepts, old uh, notions, uh, even metaphors, but in some different way. And Adorno, even uh, uh, Horkheimer and other friends, and later, uh, uh, for example, uh, Jürgen Habermas, they did, uh, they did and do, and do uh, in this one way, they take uh, the old concepts, but use them not just in completely different way, because you, as a reader, could you 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 can you cannot recognize sometimes the differences uh, between uh, one the concept and the other concept because they but they use in order to be clear the old concepts in completely negative way, in completely negative way. way. The, 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 some uh, early uh, Karl Marx books were written. 
uh, in this uh, in this uh, one way, and he Marx called this method critique of critique, critique of critique, and critique of critique is the beginning of negative dialectics. So. Uh, negative uh, dialectics was was written. The book of uh, Adorno was written in this one ironic and skeptical way, where many of uh, the old concepts were presented in this one negative or critical way without proposing nothing positive. So you need to read with some sort of self-reflection that you are working with some, um, um, you know, uh, in in some negative way, and. Um, uh, this is uh, this one sort of experience of uh, his work uh, were uh, used in previous so-called uh, apophatic uh, uh, apophatic theology, as as well in uh, uh, young by the young Hegelians, and uh, and Herbert Marcuse as well used this one uh, this one sort of method. But what is interesting in sometimes it. The, the, same, the same method is used in, in Jewish uh, mysticism in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism in Kabbalah. And there are a few even books published uh, uh, with the titles Adorno and Kabbalah. It doesn't mean that uh, Adorno was Kabbalist, nothing uh, uh, similar. But what is important that this the same negative way of Kabbalistic and as well understanding of the final solution and soft, which is invisible God. Uh, uh, and, uh, it is quite uh, quite similar to uh, and to uh, Walter uh, uh, Benjamin and to uh, Adorno uh, Adorno uh, understanding and Adorno interprets intuition in this one negative way. He has not other concept than intuition in order to describe how we connect in the theory or in artwork different elements, you know, there are many of different elements, especially in music. And you, 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 you need to remember to, to, to have in your mind all the, uh, all the uh, artwork, but you always see just only, or listen only part, small part. So in order to connect, to, to have understanding or feeling of old co composition, you need to use you need to use, uh, in old uh, theory, you need to, to, to use uh, the intuition. But uh, Adorno, highly skeptical about intuition, and he has not any other concept of what to, uh, how to say the same. So he criticized intuition, and he said that actually this one intuition is not the same like in philosophy in, of Kant, and it's not the same like in previous uh, theologian works, like in Thomas, Aqu uh, Thomas Aquinas and others. It's not the same intuition. This, uh, his intuition is based on the analysis of social relationships, economical relationships, you know, the power, uh, critique of power, of contemporary power, critique of uh, styles and tendencies in uh, contemporary art, that, that there are many of critiques and and the intuition includes all of them, you know, as some kind, some side, some kind of complex, complex approach. For him, intuition is some unreason, not enough reasonable or unreasonable, unconscious, complex approach for the understanding, for the understanding of the artwork. And it means that intuition could be developed or building could be involved into building. You could develop your own intuition by the studies of art, social critique, uh, politics. Uh, but in another way, in another way, this intuition is not given. And intuition is always on the searching. It's not scheme. It's you, uh, according to Kant or Hegel and Adorno, intuition is not a scheme. Intuition is not. Um, Intuition is not a, a, a rule, but you all, it's intuition means always searching for solution. You don't, you don't have solution, you don't know what is it, and you, you try to orient yourself when you hidden yourself in some city, when you lost yourself in city or in artwork, you need to find some uh, whole picture general picture, and for this reason you use your own intuition, which means that you use your 
all previous experience or you use all pre your pre previous observations, experience and observations. And uh, Adorno tried to explain that uh, composers or artists or even nations sometimes use intuition, intuition for the searching of the best expression. And it's a little bit similar to intuition of Wilhelm von Humboldt. Uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. So now I am turned to the civil political intuition. It's not about Adorno. Adorno didn't uh, wrote a lot about civil uh, political intuition. I just take his art intuition, concept of art intuition. But he, his approach to the music is sociological. Sociological. He wrote a lot about sociology of uh, music and art and literature as well. So this is uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, possible. Intuition is non uh, pre reflective, changing plural way of apprehending of facts. It's uh, um, then um, what I would like. Uh, to emphasize, he is well uh, wrote about intersubjective, intersubjective intuition or intersubjective observation of our experiences. This is as well similar to Hegel, to Hegel, and uh, uh, it means that not only individual his sub subjective will, but as well nation nation as some imagined community, nation as an imagined community who could build or to develop their own intuition, how to understand the some sort of uh, some sort of artwork. If we will not propose this one uh, approach, we couldn't understand why some nations choose uh, some national items, how it's happened. How, how happens that uh, nations accept some national symbols, and especially when we're talking about uh, national items. And at, at the end, I would like a little bit to pay attention to the how contemporary Belarusians, rebellion Belarusians on the protest, they, they, are search, they are searching for the national item. This is for them uh, still the problem differently, from uh, you, uh, previous Maidan and Ukraine and Lithuania and uh, 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 Lithuania and uh, Adgimimas, this uh, side this period, when we knew before uh, we, which song and music is our anthem. And for Ukrainians, it was, it was not as well uh, the, the problem. And they, and no, we, no Ukrainians didn't, didn't pay any attempt didn't they were not we were not involved into attempt to show the work of our spiritual work for the searching of, of the item and uh, anthem anthem and uh, uh, Belarusian are always on the searching of the anthem be equally at the searching of the national identity and language everything is not given Everything should be finding, find, and for this reason they need intuition. But it's not religious or theological intuition, but intuition which I described in Adornian sense. This is intuition means many of our exper complex experiences, com co complex of experiences. So in this, uh, so I, I just uh, um, uh, in this quite in this from this point is quite clear how. Uh, Adorno separate separate um, subjective will for the searching of self-expression and mechanical or digital uh, reproduction of artwork from uh, uh, Benjamin Walter uh, Benjamin. When you use schemes or cliché, when you use uh, some sorts of rules, when you know how to express and how to write, uh, for example, music or national and anthem or some other sort of symbolical uh, uh, artwork. Uh, it means that you are involved into reproduction of artwork. You are involved into, maybe you are involved 
uh, into, into uh, propaganda. But he never spoke about prayer, about the prayer, how to pray, you know, that because in praying, you always repeat and repeat the same, but it's not mechanical work. It's a little bit different. And uh, for us and for Adorno, this question of praying is quite important. And many of students and researchers who discuss, for example, the book of Horkheimer and Adorno, Dialectics uh, of Enlightenment, the ordinary repeat that just mechanical reproduction means some sort of industry. Industry is more than a mechanical reproduction, it's distribution as well and consumption, but they, for, uh, they uh, uh, forget that praying in the churches, it's repetition as well, many of repetitions, and Adorno didn't discuss this one sort of praying and rituals as a mechanical reproduction of artwork. This is absolutely different. Uh, different spiritual action, and we need to 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 uh, to separate this one too. So, uh, uh, when we are talking about Adorno and uh, contemporary music, we need to separate revolution in music and music in revolution. This is two different uh, uh, phenomena. Revolution in music, according to uh, Adorno, for example, the, according to him, it's Beethoven, Wagner, or Schoenberg. And uh, music in the revolution is completely different. We, we need to discuss what kind of songs and music were used in the, for example, period of French, Great French Revolution, uh, beginning from 1790 uh, 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 up to uh, 1793, or spring of peoples of 1848. And what's happened in this 1848, which is uh, already uh, presented in Lithuanian and Baltic history as uh, some spring of peoples and so wonderful, wonderful. But Arnold Schoenberg wrote that, uh, that anti-Semitism origin in this one year. And uh, uh, the, 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 some elements of anti-Semitism origin uh, together with the spring of peoples of European. You know, and, may, uh, and the end of the spring of this European is not just a liberation of some uh, national states like Baltic states in uh, 1918, but as well, this is uh, the, some uh, poisoned, uh, uh, poisoning, uh, ele poison elements which uh, were concluded into uh, fascism. And uh, everything started from uh, 1848. Or, I, 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 as well, when talking uh, music in the revolution, it's about February or October revolution of 1917, or perestroika music, or solidarity in Poland, or at Gimimas in Lithuania, or Maidan 2004 or 2013 or 14, or White Revolution, how it's called now, White Revolution in Belarus. So it's uh, 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 as well uh, different. And to understand uh, this uh, music in the revolution, we need to use, I propose, and Adorno proposed, to use this negative critical approach. Why? Because this will help us to separate mechanical reproduction, mechanical reproduction from the spiritual, spiritual, if you uh, would like, intuitive uh, 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 attempt to find and to work, it's work, it's work, uh, it, it's work to, uh, to create some uh, musical uh, or emotional national expression, which is not done no, in any schemas or in, in any concerts. For example, you could take uh, Slavyansky Bazaar, this is uh, Slavyansky Market, uh, Belarusian festival of music in Vitebsk, which is completely uh, creative industries, cultural industries, mechanical reproduction with all Kierkorovs and so similar singers from Russia. Uh, and all this experience from Slavyansky Bazaar couldn't be used in the street of Minsk today. You know, this, everything what you've done in this Slavyansky Bazaar doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work in, in completely protest Minsk street. Because this street and this uh, crowds on the street or peoples or, or citizens, or rather citizens, organized citizens on the street, they don't need this sort of music. 
they and they are searching for the new expression new expression and this is work of them they always change their one song to another to the third and so on in order to find the best expression for their world experience and all slavenski bazaar couldn't help for them because creative industries doesn't work together with this one searching of spiritual self expression of freedom civic freedom so this is you see so clear when you start to analyze propaganda music or cultural industries and this uh, revolutionary music this is very and very different uh, processes they and they don't have any mostly they, sometimes they don't have any connections but for from the sounding when you listen sound it listen it sounds like similar you know this is one rock and then uh, one rock this one pop music and then pop music me music and this is genre approach it doesn't help for us to understand this art uh, to the the the, the work uh, of uh, our work uh, the the work of, of the mind or uh, the work of vernunft uh, uh, so uh, so uh, this is, I, I, again, I will skip that this is mentioned about Beethoven. And uh, now what is interesting for me, this the Schoenberg, the Schoenberg uh, again, this is very classical topic. You know that those who uh, studied uh, Adorno, you know that he was follower and fan of the, the 12 tone uh, serial music, or, and he was a very big fan of uh, Arnold Schoenberg, and he called that Arnold Schoenberg Schoenberg and uh, is a completely revolutionary uh, uh, musician. But uh, Arnold Schoenberg uh, doesn't participate in any revolution. Uh, he was separately from them. And according to Adorno, one of the most revolutionary way is opera of uh, Schoenberg, Moses, and Aron. And I a little bit uh, will show you that this uh, from uh, Golden Cuff and uh, Altar, there's uh, some uh, very short uh, quote uh, from this music. But what is interesting about uh, who, uh, for those who read about this one uh, opera, you remember that opera was written in the uh, mid uh, be between two, uh, two two wars in the um, at, uh, end of 20s 1920s and uh, Schoenberg was very disappointed by the growth of anti-semitism in Germany in Austria in this time and he was like uh, Kafka Franz Kafka for searching of small literature or small music or small uh, uh, small music a small music he called his own approach as a small music like like uh, uh, Kafka uh, considered his novels uh, as a small literature as well, and Deleuze later used these uh, approaches uh, to explain because nobody would like accept this one Jewish composer, except few in, in intellectuals, you know. And uh, Arnold Schoenberg considered that his uh, opera should be completely skeptical and ironic about this period about this period and to show some uh, uh, possibility for Jewish people to create Israel as uh, some Zionistic project, which he supported in the uh, uh, 20s, in the 20s. And later Adorno, when he uh, have uh, correspondence with Tom Mann, writer Tom Mann, and Tom Mann wrote uh, the uh, novel with the title Dr. Faustus later, and uh, uh, Adorno was advisor of this uh, musical part of uh, the uh, novel, of the novel, of the fiction of uh, Tom Mann, and, uh, and, and he, they have correspondence and sent many of letters to each other. And uh, uh, Adorno recommended to take uh, this skeptical approach to the music and to the political events from the Schoenberg and concretely from the Schoenberg's uh, opera Moses and Aaron. The, the same opera was used uh, some as imagined example for the uh, exceptional and I would say revolutionary book of Thomas, uh, Thomas Mann. And, uh, uh, and okay, this one, just one little bit example, which I will not later, uh, later discuss, but to listen a little bit music.
this music uh, uh, became just uh, popular only be between at the beginning between elites and only later was used in many cases uh, for the film production and uh, okay well, i would say for creative industries but in, in this one when we listen this one music the most important to feel if you don't know nothing about uh, uh, nothing about uh, golden calf uh, note uh, nothing about egypt you know uh, exegesis uh, 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 if, if you don't know nothing about this biblical or Torah or uh, or Hindu or uh, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish uh, uh, Old Testament uh, stories, uh, in any way you will feel some very skeptical and ironic approach uh, was going on around. And uh, this skeptical approach was the critique of uh, the society of Weimar republics and e equally Austro-Hungarian Austro -Hungarian empire. And so you will uh, search some uh, solution or exodus, how to exodus, how to uh, find the solution uh, uh, under the influence of this, uh, um, uh, this uh, music. And uh, then uh, even more interesting for me, it's Adorno and ha Hans Eisler. You know, they wrote uh, together a book uh, uh, composing for the films. And Hans Eisler was a disciple of uh, Schoenberg, the first disciple officially. Maybe he, he has pre some previous disciples, but in a way. And, uh, and uh, uh, Adorno, when he wrote about uh, uh, revolution in music, revolution in music, he mentioned as well Hans Eisler. He's, uh, Hans Eisler, very ambiguous, I, I would say, very ambiguous uh, composer. He, uh, uh, okay, he uh, uh, was not, uh, uh, you know, this uh, some um, strong follower of uh, Schoenberg. He, sometimes he used this 12-tone uh, method, sometimes he used completely different methods uh, for this. Uh, but in any, in any way, uh, what is interesting about Heinz Eisler, he as well was Jewish, but didn't uh, uh, search for the solution in Zionism, but he tried to find solution in communism. This is again very interesting because uh, before Second World War, many of Jewish don't know how to behave in this anti-Semitic anti anti Europe. And, and they searched for two solutions of them. No, okay, one of them was to immigrate to the United States, but the other two solutions was or Zionism or communism, you know. And uh, Schoenberg uh, turned to Zionism and Hans Eisler to the communism. He was author of Eastern German uh, Anthem. But uh, uh, Adorno very uh, uh, highly uh, qualified uh, Eisler, and uh, this one uh, one sort of his uh, Der Heimliche Aufmarsch about uh, this uh, uh, march of uh, workers. Uh, uh, it's uh, became. Uh, became uh, one of the composition which, uh, according uh, according uh, Adorno, could be an example of revolutionary music. But this is completely different than uh, twelve tone, which is more popular. I, I would say more, more popular music. I would say that even little bit popular music. Wonderful. <laughs> This is nice. Aber da hörst du sie nicht. Es flüstern die Kohle und Stahlproduzenten. Es flüstert die chemische Kriegsproduktion. Es flüstert von allen Kontinenten. Mobilmachung gegen die Sowjetunion. Der 
You know, that uh, Eisler was as well a friend, very good friend of Bertolt Brecht. He wrote a lot of music for the uh, plays of uh, Bertolt Brecht. And in any way, uh, very nice. I very like him, uh, Hans Eisler. So, but uh, in any way, uh, you need, to, in this one way, we need to understand that, uh, that uh, Hans Eisler, he used uh, this one, he was always involved into work of searching, you know, work of searching. He never, he never knew how to express the spirit, class spirit of these workers. And he never knew which sort of music should be uh, presented as uh, exceptional, equally to Bertolt Brecht, who was, well, uh, was always under searching. And for Adorno, it means they are not, were not involved into cultural industries because they, they didn't develop this schematism and cliché. You know, this is important because you don't know and you need to use your old, all this intuition, in negative way, intuition, in order to find your, your own uh, solution. And sometimes, but could we, could we apply, could we apply the same approach for audience. Okay, I will a little bit skip some uh, some my uh, presentation because I believe that it could be too long uh, because sometimes I'm reading this one lectures for hours or hours and going to uh, some uh, some uh, conclusion. And now I would like a little bit to stop about. Uh, uh, okay, that's a revolution. One of them, which is important, I need to quote from Adorno, the, the revolution, revolutionary moment in the civil life or in art is the resolution gradual and lasting of some of the most fundamental contradictions, the most universal conflicts, which can be expressed in a general form by the concept of antagonism between the accepted form of expression and, or submission, and the new aspiration of the spirit, the new demands of relations. If Wilhelm von Humboldt uh, wrote this uh, sentence, we will accept it, the sentence like no, normal, coherent, uh, for the, the uh, uh, Humboldtian approach. So they, they are in this one sense uh, quite similar, but from the other, it means and where, when we are talking about some life experience life work, life art work, or life art searching, uh, we need always to remember about this one conflict. We, we need to search for conflict, for the contradictions. If there are not con contradictions, it means that uh, uh, this one, uh, this one uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't work. And I would like to start maybe uh, uh, okay, uh, 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 I would like to start a uh, li little bit to remember some small quotes from uh, Searching for National Anthem, which I mentioned. That's because uh, Belarusian rebellions don't, uh, don't know exactly which sort of anthem could be accepted for all nations, but all the music are not, no one of the song, no one of the music are not ac still accepted as a national anthem. That is many of attempts, they are in the searching. The first uh, uh, official national anthem of Bel Belarus is this one, which is completely rejected. Nobody sings this song on the street. <laughs> This is Soviet from Soviet time. Uh, as ordinary, Lukashenko just changed a few words in the uh, in the verses, you know, and nothing changed in the music. It's the same, uh, which was uh, before 1990. And another one, uh, which uh, many of nationalists uh, they uh, thought that this one could be official uh, uh, anthem, national anthem, uh, doesn't uh, didn't doesn't be become uh, popular, and later I will explain why.
This is one old Lithuanian uh, 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 military, this uh, Staradowny Litovsky Pagoni, this one, uh, three words, uh, which, uh, uh, trans uh, he, which uh, done uh, this uh, uh, and an unacceptable for Russian speakers. You know, they don't like to accept themselves like Litvins, Lithuanians in Belarusian style, and they don't like to imitate uh, themselves about it's approximately 80 percentage of population of Belarus. For them, this anthem as well not uh, acceptable, but for 20, it's like uh, ritual, religious, science, music, uh, they could start and be on their own imagined Maidan for the, uh, to, to fight until death, you know, with this one song and music. But for the majority of Belarusian, it's not, still not, still. This is very important, this one still. And uh, this again, the very interesting, and all these clips uh, which was done in Lithuania, you know. This is again uh, important. And when you listen contemporary uh, Minsk streets, uh, they ordinarily never think uh, this uh, song. Very rare, very rare, uh, I would say. The third is uh, that um, Nekleyev, uh, poet uh, Nekleyev uh, and uh, Beitsukevich, uh, the singer, they proposed the another. Uh, uh, another anthem, which is even less popular than uh, Pagonia, but it's about national flag. It could be. I'm sorry. Luna is a Наш открыли червоны от боли белый стях. Наш бел червона белый, небесный вольный смелый. Наш бел червона белый стях. Без конца наша мара от свободе. Веди нас по земли и по воде. And that, uh, unfortunately, I, it's even uh, more difficult because uh, many of uh, Belarusians don't know exact uh, 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 Belarusian language. This is one of the sort. And the other, at the beginning, this one flag was not popular. This flag started to be popular only from the beginning, somewhere uh, mid of uh, uh, August and beginning of September for the all, uh, and, and maybe this, and because this rhythm, a little bit rock rhythm, you know, of music, it, it doesn't sound like a uh, classical, uh, classical anthem. For the, for the joke, for the joke, they proposed Russian speakers, the, uh, the another example, which is completely, actually very strange, but sometimes they call, this is our real, today, real, uh, a real anthem. It's uh, with a title Three Turtles uh, or Three Charapahi, which is completely stupid, but they call it like uh, our contemporary item. This is unbelievable, but they are happy from this one music. <laughs> It's very strange because it's uh, really revolutionary mu music, but was uh, but verses were written for kids, you know, and somewhere about ten years or more ago, and this uh, song was for kids, and later was used by the by the rock musicians and start to be completely popular because it's so simple and everybody could learn this uh, twenty words, you know. This is uh, then uh, the other what was uh, done. Uh, that uh, they tried to take uh, from Polish uh, anti-communist so solidarity song, Muri, but uh, because uh, from the beginning they don't understand that it's not uh, Belarusian music, everybody considered that it's possible uh, anthem, but later they recognized that it's Polish music, not, uh, not. and so I'm showing you not uh, Belarusian, uh, but uh, Polish, uh, uh, Polish uh, case. So 
So uh, Belarusians take uh, this one uh, music from uh, a revolution abroad, you know. If you don't have your own song, maybe you could take from abroad, you know, foreigners. This is uh, uh, Solidarność, you know, uh, music from 1981. Uh, early Solidarność. Then they try to take uh, this uh, uh, perestroika music, uh, Viktor Tsoi Perimen. They translate it even, even into Belarusian language. This is, was, was not uh, acceptable. At the end, I would say that success of that, oh, sorry, the final, which I would like in any way to remember, and Ukrainians, and uh, that um, uh, situation uh, the situation with the uh, with the uh, anthem of Ukraine on Maidan, which uh, at the same mind an anthem could be interpreted as a creative industries, you know, because repetition mechanical. It could be interpreted as an ideology and propaganda as well. Anthem works uh, in the style of propaganda and uh, persuasion, but uh, as well as a prayer. Anthem could be element could be used as a prayer, and I I am witness my friends and because I was as well on little bit on Maidan, I just remember that sometimes you could pray because so was big fear, you know, uh, uh, anxiety and fear, and sometimes you could uh, um, sing an anthem and the anthem work like a prayer, you know? And this one uh, sort from the very, uh, I would say, uh, 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 that the peak, uh, the uh, top of conflict on Maidan. And you will see this is when uh, people uh, think the uh, anthem as prayer, as a pray. And because I, I've saw that another possibility uh, on 10 seconds, uh, that Kupalinka, this is as well a song was uh, uh, presented as well as a prayer, praying uh, bec uh, in front of Amon. In, uh, in, but uh, as well, it's uh, very interesting that uh, I don't have time for that, but at least to show this one very good example. <laughs> Unbelievable example. So thank you. Thank you, Gintas, very much for your uh, rich presentation. And it seems that we have to invite you to our Academy of Music for a series of lectures because it would be really very interesting. Now we have uh, some five minutes for discussion. First of all, I would like to show our, our online audience and our colleagues that we have here real audience from my computer. So, and our real audience uh, could... Uh, uh, question something, I, I will give you a microphone. And our online uh, particip participants are welcome to ask some questions or to discuss uh, in chat. So please, do we have some questions? This one in front of yeah. us. Thank you for interesting presentation, and uh, I agree with you that uh, people in the street of uh, Belarusian towns and cities they would never sing some song from the Eurovision contest. <laughs> But uh, I think that uh, uh, national movements, they borrow songs 
from each other. They continue to sing some heritage of earlier appraisals and movements. Uh, the form may be, may be surprising. Uh, was a style of uh, the Lithuanian <laughs> national movement. At Gimima Sayudis, I noticed that there are some similarities with soul music, with gospel style, and it means they were impressed by the non-violent movement of Afro-Americans. I mean, uh, the time of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's it not a big surprise. <laughs> yeah, I would in interpret, you know, that you, when, you, when we remember about the uh, Lithuanian side, this just is very important to, to remember as well this uh, festivals of songs, uh, uh, for example, 1988, and as well rock march, uh, rock movement in, in this period in Lithuania, and many of rock groups try to find uh, some sort of expression for the people, for the uh, uh, for the people, uh, the music which will be uh, available and acceptable for big uh, crowds on this period and. Uh, if we will uh, check uh, pre-perestroika or pre this period, 1987, 1987, this is beginning of Rock March. And if you will check that uh, repertoire, all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, what kind of music it was and uh, uh, that you, you uh, it, it will be very as well interesting that some pop uh, music were used as some sort of national uh, the expression of national dignity or freedom and uh, this music uh, from the uh, from the style or genre uh, uh, are very similar to Eurovision even, but in this uh, period, for example, Ante, the, the band Antis and uh, the song, uh, pop music song, Natal Martina Emelianas Dangus. It was like uh, 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 thousands and thousands of people sang uh, this, uh, 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 sang the song and uh, you know, but uh, in another way, uh, for me, was not I was not interested in concrete, uh, concrete verses or concrete song. That for me, much more important is to understand searching for the song. It's not about song. It's uh, it's not about concrete melody. It's about searching an attempt. You know that you need uh, one song this one week and the, the, the other song you will use for the, uh, another week and why this changing happened, why these changes is happened, you know. And uh, the answer is uh, that these changes are happened because people, citizens, looking for self-expression. And they are, uh, they are looking in all the music on historical as well contemporary as well anthems, as well as well any genres, which could satisfy in the best way their feeling of freedoms, you know. And what is interesting that in majority cases, in majority creative industries couldn't help for them. For example, many of uh, bands of uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, rib, uh, rib, uh, Revelation, uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, uh, revelation, or uh, Belarusian, or if you will check uh, Ukrainian cases, accept this anthem, uh, that all the bands try to suppose, propose something. And like in Belarus music today, they, many of singers try to, uh, to supply some, some music for them, and streets, Streets don't accept this supply because it, this supply doesn't satisfy their feeling of freedom. And this unsuccess of many, many, of, many of musicians is equally important and interesting. They try and try to supply and nothing happened. Streets don't like to sing these songs, you know, 
and what to do, how to find. Even the best poets, the best composers would like to supply. And people didn't listen to this music because it's not satisfy their need for expression. And this, this is object of my research, but not the music. Uh, we have one uh, question in chat, but before that, uh, Lina Navitskaita and Martinella will ask. Thank you very much for, for the inspiring talk. Uh, I just have a comment, a musicological comment. Uh, I was very much intrigued by this distinction of revolution in music and music and revolution. And of course, there could be a lot added to Adorno's distinction and which three composers does he mention? Because obviously there could be many, many more. But what's wonderful, I think, and quite peculiar is that in quite a few cases, the music and revolution and revolution in music coincide, actually. So we know very well how Beethoven has been used by both the left and the right as for millions of occasions on all sides. Well, Wagner is clearly the rightist for sure. But there is one, uh, one very interesting case from the 19th century Italy, the Italian Risorgimento, where Giuseppe Verdi yeah, was yeah, yeah. the composer who supplied the music for the masses. And uh, this, uh, this acronym, Viva Verdi, was amazing because it stood actually for Viva Vittorio Emanuele Re d'Italia. And uh, yeah, this is quite a wonderful case of how the compositional music can be transferred to the streets. And even if nowadays we don't probably think that Verdi was a huge innovator in musical terms, but he was a reformer of Italian opera, especially the orchestra in, in Italian opera. So, well, I wonder, the, these times I can't even recall of any like contemporary compositional music that could actually reach the streets in, in, in such a variety as, as it was then. You know that uh, uh, Adorno, when he spoke about uh, revolution in music, he used the same formula as Hegel when he discussed uh, revolution in philosophy. And he, Hegel said that French uh, politicians, they did the revolution uh, in the period of great French revolution. This is political. And we Germans did the same revolution, but in philosophy, L look like a parallel. And uh, the same formula exists for the explanation of Beethoven, uh, great French revolution and the revolution in music in Austria, in, in Vienna. This is uh, like separate, this is outside and inside the same. And wh when we are talking about revolution uh, in the Belarus, white revolution, and uh, music for revolution, that revolution in music could happen somewhere, somewhere who, who are looking for the, into the Belarusian revolution, who are inspired by this one. And this revolution in music could happen somewhere in Sweden, if you would like. So and now we have one more question in chat by Emilia Sakadorskine, who asked, you focused on Central and Eastern Europe. South Africa also used music extensively in the anti-apartheid protest. Mm -hmm. Have you had the opportunity to compare the function of music in that context? Oh, yes, you know, that uh, question is quite important, but not only a part about apartheid, but you know that I use all examples about national revolutions, but there are as well class revolutions, gender revolutions, if you will like anti-racist revolutions or uh, anti uh, uh, and, uh, uh, protest against anti-Semitism, you know, and defense from anti-Semitism uh, as well, uh, anti-racist uh, revolutions. And many of them, they need as well music, and some of them, they use these uh, uh, songs as an, as an anthems, you know, like Solidarność, you, uh, and we went, uh, mentioned this Muri uh, song, you know that uh, this uh, song doesn't uh, sound uh, like an anthem classical. You know, this is pop uh, cultural music, but in any way, this music was used 
by the Solidarność in this period as an anthem, you know. And so it means that some jazz composition could be used by the uh, black, ma uh, that's uh, um, uh, for the black movement or Indian movement or apartheid movement. And this music could be completely different in style and genre, but we are talking about, not about genres, but we are talking about searching for self-expression uh, uh, if you would like class dignity or gender dignity or ra race dignity or equality, you know, and for the self-expression, you need to find this one sort of music like Latins, uh, Latin uh, Americans found them for themselves, uh, this uh, very sm simple music devoted to Che Guevara, Comandante Che Guevara, as many left Latin America leftists and communists, they, they use this one music, music, not, not the song, but especially music, as some, some kind of inspiration for the, uh, for the revolutionary movement. And this music as well could be used for propaganda purposes later. So you see, this is uh, ambiguous and we need to discuss this ambiguity and these contradictions in a way. And then uh, about apartheid is the same. Against apartheid is the same. Thank you very much. I have to close uh, this Thank discussion you. because we have uh, a short, short uh, uh, coffee break, but just uh, would like to thank again Gintotas Majekis and to uh, also put your attention to two very important, I think, uh, notions or definitions. I mean, function of music in the liberation and, and political movement and also recontextualization of music and both these uh, notions could be new topics for new conference. So thank you very much again for everybody and we will meet in 15 minutes in, in two parallel Sessions. So again, I will repeat what I said that uh, this uh, session, in this session, we will have pre-presentations pre of our colleagues from uh, Academy of Music in Poland, and the uh, papers are part of our joint uh, scholarly uh, Polish and Lithuanian project, Music of Change, Cultural Expression of Liberation in Lithuanian and Polish Music. And uh, for speaking in this session is Professor Malgorzata Janiska Slysh, and she is a leading specialist in several uh, areas of studies, including Karol Szymanowski, Lithuanian music, Lithuanian Polish uh, musical collaboration, and others. And the title of her paper is In the Poetics of Experience on Polish Music from the Perspective of Affective Tone of the 1990s. So please, Małgorzata. So thank you very much for the possibility to be together in this very complex time. But thanks to technology, we can create interpersonal bridge. So I would like to say good morning to everybody, especially to my Lithuanian colleagues. The title of my presentation is connected with very important effective turn in Polish humanities of the 1990s in the poetics of uh, experience. The category of affect is one of the key figures of thought in contemporary humanities. It is also a significant concept in theoretical and musical reflection about the humanist orientation. Mieczysław Tomaszewski, the creator of the Kraków theoretical school, appealed repeatedly for research into the expression of the musical work. He explained that, I quote, in the work itself, not outside it, lies the main efficient cause of the work's influence, generating directions and categorical quality sets in particular phases, sound production, auditory perception, and sign symbolic reception of the work. It categorically determines the shape of its verbalization. The author of the integral interpretation consisting in considering a musical work from its origin and creative concept through artistic materialization, performance and perception to reception and resonance appeal, appeal not to cut off from the work neither its author 
Now, the issues related to expression. The study of the expression of music, the intentional one, assumed by the composer, for instance, in the form of markings, author notes, included in the text of the work, for example, Dolce, Appassionato, or Cantabile, was emitted in musicology with a scientist or neo-positivist profile. There was a kind of timidity, emotive issues. Reflections of expressive nature were treated as outdated post-romantic heritage. They were also connected with going beyond the level of musical language and the necessary redirection of analysis understood technologically to the level of musical poetics connected with interpretation. And this interpretation assumes co-participation in the course of music as a researcher or as a performer and allowing the work to move us. Reality wrote its own script. After all, part of the narrative of culture includes the notion of transgression, i.e. going beyond the existing canon, not only in terms of music itself, but also in terms of music research. That is why the notion of a turning point, a breakthrough or a nodal moment for historical dramaturgy has become established in history. From the perspective of such turning points or nodal moments of the artist's life, Mieczysław Tomaszewski created an invariant model of the artist's biography. Six key moments, so you can see on slides. Taking over the heritage, first fascination, opposition and rebellion, significant encounter, threat to existence, and loneliness and liberation. A significant breakthrough a humanist turning point was visible in Polish music of the Stalowa Wola generation, in composers making their debut during the Krzysztof Drobas original Indo Liberation Festival, young musicians for the young town in the mid 1970s. When asked what were we about, Leszek Polony, my colleague from the Academy of Music in Krakow, the author of excellent books on hermeneutics, answered Lesha Polony's words, I quote, it was about finding the blurred lost sense of music, creative activity and human existence in the world in general, about personal affirmation of obvious values which are not new after all, unquote. Values rejected by the avant-garde, such as euphony, a new tonal order or melody, appear in the music of the representatives of the generation in question, composers born in 1951, namely Andrzej Krzanowski, Eugeniusz Knapik, and Alexander Lasso. This is why they were also named the new romantics. And one example from the famous string quartet by Eugeniusz Knapik to movements dramaturgy, a song, and to this composer, Mike Largo, same picture, Cantabile. So this is the humanist turning point in Polish culture. Yet another breakthrough noticeable in Polish culture and communities was described as an effective term. Richard Nitsch, in literature, author of the book with a meaningful title, The Poetics of Experience, writes in 2012 and 2015 about this turning point that, I quote, it is probably the last of the most influential new orientations that have so far become established and gained some legitimacy in the new humanities. It is also a very representative type of study of phrase for this area. At the same time, he explains, I mean, Richard Nitsch, I quote, it is hard not to notice that it tackles issues as old as culture and the humanities themselves, but at the same time, does so in a way that reorientates and restructures the field of research, generates new subdisciplines, such as, for example, exploring emotional communities and rare role in historical and civilizational processes, reconfigures the positions and meanings of other important terms in the humanist dictionary, such as especially intellect, mind, experience, matter, 
sensuality or carnality, unquote. Thus, it makes sense to consider music in affective, po in affective poetics, which, as Przemysław Czapliński writes in 2015, aims at analyzing and let us at interpreting, considering the impact of the text and the audience on each other, contrary to the avant-garde technology of the poetics of strangeness. The work is perceived as a communicative play of affections and the recipient being moved, being in awe or affected, begins to participate in the perception and reception process on the basis of empathy or divergence. This kind of interaction between the text and the listener hung in the air already in Polish sonoristic ways. Uh, they were never merely an abstract interplay of rebellious sounds obtained in an innovative, innovative way. The targeted consequences became dramatized stories. It is enough to recall, for example, four senses by Krzysztof Penderecki, or refrained by Henryk Mikołaj Gurecki. And now, a very short uh, example from uh, very interesting uh, recording, Penderecki conducts Penderecki and fragment from Fluorescences, piece from 1962. Um. me but we have no time to show all piece but I think it's a kind of intonation characterized for such dramatized stories. The powerful expression was supposed to move and even shock the listener, composing his or her perception for the reception of strong affect affections. The multiplicity of expressive terms that distinguish Gretzky's music already from Admaturam is a result of human emotions. It is not an expression of structure or, or abstraction. Such a repertoire of expressive terms can also be found in Wojciech Ziemowich z różnie different for two pianos and percussion. So you can see two sheets for a new system, I mean order of pitches, but the repertoire of effective terms like in traditional music, for example, in Szymanowski. The 90 minute treatise on time is anchored in the philosophy of Jacques Derrida and the poetry of Georg Trakl. The affective poetics, as Czapliński writes, asks not only how and which effects were played out in the work, but also for which effect in the audience. Only the audience understood in this way in the work becomes a reader in effect. Karol Berger, accepting the thesis that, I quote, music has a much more direct and stronger impact on us than sculpture or painting, states tellingly, I quote, I must feel the music before I can think about it. I must feel before I can think about it. Even uh, Grażyna Bacewicz, who wrote in her letter to her Lithuanian brother Vitatas Bacewicz in 1958, I quote, for me, composing work is like chiseling in stone and not transferring the sounds of imagination or inspiration onto paper, stated, I quote, composers were in a way ashamed of their emotionality. So I rejected this shame and I write emotional music. Marek Stachowski's auto-reflection is also marked by emotion. 
It will be the state 24, the, world, uh, the year 1994. I quote, the imperative of intensified expression resides in me. It is stronger than means. The language changes, but emotions remain. According to Peter Kivy, we interpret the expressive coloring of music in a similar way to the way we read emotions from a person's face. We understand the message, although no words are spoken. It was already Leonard B. Mayer who supported the view that every era can produce a very complex system of connotations in which certain melodic, rhythmic, or harmonic means become signs of certain states of mind or are used to designate specific emotional states. He also noted that these means function as formulas that signal a culturally codified mood or feeling. For those who know them, these signs can be strong factors conditioning reactions. I remember well the reaction of the audience and my own when I heard live Krzysztof Penderecki's A Sea of Dreams Did Breathe On Me, Songs of Reflection and Nostalgia uh, in 2011 at the Krakow Philharmonic. The fragment from the poem Chopin's Grand Piano by Cypre and Kamil Norwid, one of the Polish national poet, quoted by the composer in the center of peace, I visited you in those near final days, is a significant element inscribed in the collective emotional memory of the Polish audience, like the song anthem of solidarity movement, Walls, Mur, uh, quoted by the professor in keynote lecture. It is not the first time that the composer, Ami Penderecki, has composed his audience perception in such a way as to trigger extreme feelings thanks to the quotation strategy. We are, after all, states Marek Zaleski, the creation of our memories. Therefore, Jennifer Robinson stresses that expression is the result of the development of the course of music, not an isolated gesture. And three very important cases. Uh, we can risk formulated a thesis that the music created in Poland here and now is post-sonorist or neo-sonorist. Jarosław Plonka, born in 1984, does not deny that one of the sources of inspiration for him was Krzysztof Penderecki's Threnody, an extremely expressive sonoristic piece. Plonka's works include such composition as Year of Silence or Detroit Landscape which can be performed both in traditional concert space as well as in a architecturally interesting facility with elements of a performance event. So this effective turning point uh, is parallel to so-called you know, performative turning point. The main goal for piano hooligan, Piotr Orzechowski, Boiti, has become one of the well-known duties of the art of rhetoric, to move the listener. Yet the young master of improvisation art admits, I quote, recognizing the performance is a fundamental sense of music. This notion may also include singing. I suggest classifying improvisation as a creating or creative performance. I, I would like to recommend you on YouTube to listen to fragments, for example, from the recording uh, entitled 24 prelates and improvisation, not fugues, but improvisations. And one thought from Anna Zawadzka Gołosz, the author of such works as Concerto for Guitar and String Orchestra, or Suite of Space, and very important work, composed in 2018, um, commissioned by the Warsaw Autumn, ex motto dedicated to the memory of Krzysztof Droba. The foundation of uh, ex motto is philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. Anna Zawadzka Gołosz, despite Harry Lehman's prediction that sound is over, very dangerous thesis, admits, I quote, sounds has great strength. Even a single sound touches us. It can embrace us, intrigue us, but it can also 
heart to us. And when a sound merges with another, a relationship begins to form a context. And this starts to mean something. When sounds create a high degree of organization by music, we can speak of a message, an artistic expression. And conclusion. What distinguishes the Polish composer school in the 1960s and early 1970s was expressive sonorism, devoted to the genre memory, which was object in nature. The humanist romantic breakthrough in the mid 1970s redirected the composer's imagination towards values cautiously lost or forgotten by the avant-garde. The intense individual subjective expression was in the foreground. Structure was subordinated to that expression. The affective turn, which took place in the 1990s, directs its attention towards the poetics of experience. Elaborating on Przemysław Czapliński's thought, the affections experienced in music become stimuli for the audience who begins to participate in the narration of the work. In the Polish musical culture, this line, in a sense, derives from Witold Lutosławski's two parts musical dramaturgy and the conscious composition of the listener perception, moving his imagination. In Marcel Chyrzejski's latest work, Adagio for Orchestra, dedicated to Krzysztof Penderecki, who died on 20, nine March this year, we experience the aforementioned communicative play on affects. The gestures and intonations evoked from Penderecki's repertoire have been inscribed in an individual pattern of Fijinsky's personality, assimilated with his sound landscape. Also, thanks to quotation from Penderecki's fourth symphony, Adagio in Adagio, so double strategy. And now, short fragment from this first performance of Krzyński's Adagio dedicated to Krzysztof Penderecki from Silesian Philharmonic in the beginning of May of this year. typical intonation for Pedalski's repertoire, not only motives but also motion. This is the end of the work by Marcel Chyrzyński. And the last thought from my paper presentation, the gestures and intonations evoked from Penderecki's repertoire have been inspired in an individual pattern of Chyrzyński's personality, assimilated with his sound language. There remained the form and content of the memory, which is conducive to what Anna Henczka Gotkowska calls effective listening. And only such listening, experiencing music, favors the creation of meanings and senses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malgorzata, very much for your presentation. and. Uh, we again have possibility for audiences here to ask some questions and in chat you also welcomed uh, something to discuss, to question and to comment. So, and I am very interested in one uh, 
one thing in your presentation. You mentioned that in the 90s, some change in Polish culture and humanities was described as affective tone. So may you comment a little bit because we used to think about this as um, general international some, yes, trend is yes. affective tone. Yes, of course, not maybe only characterized for Polish culture, but um, in Polish literature, I mean, such researchers like Ryszard Nycz or Przemysław Czapliński, this term is commonly used. I mean, this term of effective turning point and this category of poetics of experience. So I think it's very important because um, it's uh, in contrary to, for example, to such thesis like in Harry Lehman's philosophy that uh, sound is over, this is the end of music. But I think it's very important to uh, articulate that we exist in this sphere, I mean, poetics of experience. So in Polish literature, in many texts, we have to do with such perspective, to read, to analyze, to interpret music from such point of view, because uh, for many years we had to do with so-called timidity surrounding emotion issues. So it was not um, common uh, attempt to music. I mean, this study uh, of expressive genre, of expressive style. So this is not common for all music theory and musicology. Hence, I mentioned uh, here of Professor Mieczysław Tomaszewski, who repeatedly uh, was stressing necessity uh, for such research, I mean, expression, intentional expression itself, the work, not outside. But I think after um, 1990s, we have to do with such new process uh, with uh, not only consisting itself the work, but also uh, in the interaction between the text and the audience. Maybe we can observe not only in Poland, of course, but maybe this expressive style is characterized for general type of Polish music. You can recall sonoricism. Sonoricism was also very expressive, not only connected with new system of pitches, new types of articulations of sounds, etc. Do we, do we have more? Yes, questions? Uh, yes, more questions. So I also would like to thank you for remembering us uh, theory of Ms. Chislav Tomaszewski. And it seems to me that he presented for a first time this just beginnings of his uh, theory in Vilnius in 2008 when we organized some congress on, on music signification, yes? Uh, and I think it's now we see the very results of this theory and the uh, not only Polish musicologists but also Lithuanian uh, musicologists uh, mm, try to adapt this theory for, for our studies of music. So if we uh, haven't more questions, we probably will later uh, discuss after a whole session. Mm -hmm. And much. now I, it's very strange to say to uh, give a floor because when we, are <laughs> we have a Zoom session, but this time I, will, I would like to give a floor for our next speaker. It's Andrzej Mondro, and he sent us pre-recorded uh, video for better quality of sound and video. And uh, Andrzej, I do not see you. 
Yes, Anje is also here in the session, and uh, we may have um, uh, we could ask him questions uh, and to discuss after his presentation. So please, our technicians help to start his pre-recorded video. So, Anji Mondro is also music theorist at Academy. Music, Academy of Music in Krakow, and the title of his topic of his presentation is Jazz Scene in Poland in 1990s. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the possibility of remote participation in the conference. It seems to me that my subject fits well with the issues of freedom in music, showing it in the most glaring, even extreme form. Besides, it gives the opportunity to draw attention to an important phenomenon, but still not studied, hidden under the mythology of the first Polish jazz school. It is worth recalling that in the 1990s, Bent Miłość was one of the best and most valued since 1994, it was at the forefront of the annual Jazz Forum polls. It was chosen the Acoustic Band of the Year four times in a row. In 2001, it was hailed as the Group of the Past Decade. The main methodological inspiration during the research was the concept of microhistory, constituting a specific approach within anthropology, focusing on the evolution of local cultures and societies. The center of the analysis is not only the processes themselves, but the communities, subcultures, bands and men who are allowed to speak in their own voice. Hence, this text contains a lot of quotes from interviews. Against the background of the rough communist Polish reality of the 1960s, jazz seemed to be a synonym of freedom, independence and modernity. But already in the 80s, its potential was exhausted, the more so because rock and punk grew in power as a symptoms of the social rebellion of the new generation. The Polish jazz scene was dominated by the old masters. There was no fresh blood. Tymon Tymański, a pioneer of jazz and the founder of the band Miłość, recalls that many musicians wanted to distance themselves from it. I quote, the jazz of the 80s was for us a synonym of artistic decline. What is worse, official artistic activity was then subordinate to the state. Censorship and strict control of public speaking condemned rebels and innovators to the margins. It was not easy to get to the fore. Tymański adds, I went through a torment of maturing in an era of impossibility and prohibition, in the center of grey, depressing commune with its ubiquitous propaganda. So artists could en only enjoy real freedom by creating in the underground. In such an environment, Totart, one of the main roots of Yaz, was born. This avant-garde alternative art formation, focused around Gdańsk and Bydgoszcz, fed on the influences of the most subversive art trends of the 20th century – Futurism, Dadaism, Surrealism, Happening, Fluxus, etc. Journalist Maciej Chmiel claims that everything you did back then was political in its own way. The bizarre behavior of Totart, the so-called transgressions, bore the hallmarks of a manifesto, but more like an anarchistic shout. Here we are and we want to do something with our life. Double bass player Olgierd Walicki recalls, we all sat in one rehearsal room where anyone could drop in and start a band with a strange name. Total freedom. It coincided with the change of the system and we felt subcontinuously that certain limitations were ending. This nascent yas was a beautiful way for us to express positive emotions. Suddenly, we all had a lot of creative power. 
The generation of children of the 1968 revolutions, which was maturing in the 80s, finally wanted to make this revolution in Poland not read about it. Thus the actions of young artists were driven by the myths of beatniks, free jazz, punk rock and new wave, at the same time signaling the birth of music that would synergistically combine the most rebellious and pro-freedom genres. As the prominent journalist Rafał Księżyk states, the jazz row was a breakthrough, heralding the advent of a new time. Cloudy, inspired punk crowned the 1980s. But the next era needed different energy, and jazz carried it. It was also inspired, but bursting with crazy, absurd humor, intriguing with a grotesque grimace, variety and openness. Mikołaj Czaska recalls that the 80s were a time of emptiness, which demanded a rebellion. Hippies were basically harmless to the system because they only had their peace and love. But there was no place or time for them then, since Poland is cold, even in summer. Tymański adds, it was our form of protest. We wanted not only a new country like Solidarność, but a new world in general. We felt that we were outside this whole system. After the political transformation, punk lost its importance. Hence the turn of the young alternative scene towards free jazz, which seemed to be a no man's land. But there was still the myth of Komeda or Tomasz Steinko. As Tymański says, we felt that we could tear off a fragment, some Quebec, and create our own republic. Tomasz Gwinciński believes that shock related to the change of the system still prevailed. Everything in the country was changing. For a moment there was a sense of freedom. Everyone felt up to doing something of their own. By using various often extreme means, Yas openly and radically opposed the musical canons and the orders found in art and pop culture. A matter of fact, it was opposed to everything. The authorities, the sluggish bland society, the conformist media and the consumerism of early capitalism. Ideologically, Yas still revolved around punk but above all should be considered a hypertrophy of the jazz idea of freedom, implemented and brought to the fore yet in the 1960s. The freedom of artistic experimentation was practiced here even at the price of eclectism and knocking on open doors. Jazz was innovative, though not in a compositional or technical sense, but in a style. It was an intriguing but also controversial phenomenon, not avoiding moral provocations, vulgarisms and obscenity. The term jazz was coined by Tymański, clarinetist Jerzy Mazolewski and guitarist Tomasz Gwinciński. The first jazz album is Tańce Pytgowskie by the group Tritony, founded by Gwinciński. The scene included bands such as Woscott, Arrhythmic Perfection, Kury, Tymański Jazz Ensemble and several others. The leading jazz group was Miłość, where the expressive and eccentric personalities of Tymański and Czaska clashed with the musical technique and seriousness of Maciej Sikawa and Leszek Morzer. The collective was joined by talented universal drummer Jacek Olter. The beginnings of the Miłość band dates back to 1988, but it became more widely known in 1992, thanks to the Jazz Juniors Festival. In the same year, the name Jazz appeared on a poster promoting their phonographic self-titled debut. 
the original and rich artistic potential of these musicians, germinating back in the communist era, already in free Poland they used to the limits of possible and absurdity. Chaska explains. Suddenly it turned out that from today a lot is possible, and yesterday it was impossible to do anything. We could finally play and we did not need verification for that. The subsequent albums Taniec Smoka and Asthmatic turn out to be even more yassy. The band also managed to record two special albums with the legendary avant-garde trumpet player from United States, Lester Bowie. The innocuous sounding name Miłość was supposed to emphasize a positive and affirmative message. It is also resulted from the fascination with the late Coltrane. The group's music is ardent, even ecstatic, but there is no pathos in it. Rather ironic, grotesque, deliberate, inadequacy and anti-heroic approach. Many pieces, uh, such as Softies by Profession or Plasma Each, are musical antics, frills and mischiefs. The very title of the track says a lot about ironic attitude of the musician. The precise arrangement of themes is combined here with a non-harmonic improvisation and sensitivity to the phrase or sound itself. Tribalism and free jazz shamanism is close to the attitude of such legends as Ornette Coleman or Albert Eiler, but it also comes from African traditions which is why it is far from a cold conceptual avant-garde. Unbridled madness or clownishness was most evident during concerts, where the band mixed various forms. Widzę wiele, odczuwam więcej. Harmonia sfery jest dla mnie słyszalną. Na parapecie hoduje magiczną urplancę. This is less evident in the softened recordings, but even here it is easy to see numerous jokes about traditional jazz and blues. A sincere nod to the past was only the modality straight from Davies or Zappa. It conditioned a kind of trance and from it, in the opinion of the musicians, it was already a step away from spirituality. In order to negate the ossified idiom of the jazz or blues form, Miłość used various formal measures. The dance of the Dragons album usually consists of several asymmetrical themes. You can also find here pieces that are more conceptualized and cooler in expression, reminiscent of proto-free jazz recordings by Lenin Tristano. 
They are tonal or pseudo dodecaphonic the left side yas and the bardo of life also sounds modern. There are a lot of various references, pseudo quotes, allusions and hidden musical references here. Miłość had particular respect for the eccentrics of the 20th century avant-garde. Tymański repeatedly emphasized that his favorite composer is Charles Ives, hence the interpretations of songs Maple Leaves or Evening and musical dedications. In turn, rock inspirations are visible in piece The Dance of the Dragon, which was supposed to be a travesty of Pavlov's dogs by the iconic 80s Republika. The Last of Human Dragons is a reference to the legendary rock album Sgt. Pepper by the Beatles. A particular example of negative inspiration is Asthmatic, which the musicians define as sham jazz and whose title mockingly refers to the cult album Astigmatic by the Comeda Quintet. It's like an attempt to disenchant the cult surrounding the most outstanding Polish jazz album. In my opinion, the artistic activity of the Miłość band and the entire jazz scene provide excellent examples of the full use of artistic freedom in all its shades, in unrestrained and stylistic diversity, in spontaneity of uh, improvisation, in debauchery of means, frivolity and stage shameless. It is a tribute to the idea of total freedom announced in the Totart movement. This freedom is no longer used in the fight against the system, but for the freedom itself. The legacy of Yas consists of several dozen albums, but also a living myth of an idealistic artistic movement, striving from the true and final liberation of sounds and words. A group of enthusiasts who want to explode the jazz milieu from the inside, unleashed a small revolution with the futures of national upheaval, significant enough to change Polish jazz forever. Miłość was the undoubtedly and prominent band which managed to create an alternative to the conservative mainstream. Interestingly, after year 2000, when the Yas impetus had burned out, a figure who today is difficult to aesthetically associate with the subversive activity of Yas managed to enter this mainstream. I am talking about Leszek Mosger. He is currently one of the most outstanding Polish jazz musicians, an original creator and a world-class pianist. The other musicians went in a different direction. Trzaska writes, among others, film music, as does Tymański who is also the founder of several rock bands. Finally, a question can be asked. Is it nowadays possible to create one dominant form of generational rebellion, one channel through which juvenile anger and vigor can flow into the consumer's ears and eyes? It seems not, because the key slogans of the present day are multiplicity and diversity. Neither jazz, nor rock, nor even metal have any firepower in Poland. But non-restriction with tradition or stylistic convention instilled so deeply that it became obvious. Freedom and broad horizon exudes in the work of most young jazz musicians. Nevertheless, they are still writing their history. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Angie. And I would like to ask if you would like to comment something shortly before questions. So, Angie, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yes, now, yes. Okay. 
Thanks. Uh, yes, Mike, just uh, if, if you would like to comment something shortly before all the questions. No, I think not. That is <laughs> enough for me. But uh, uh, last days I mm, thought about this uh, last, my last thesis. It is mm -hmm. possible to, to, to create something uh, new in popular music or in jazz music, mm, something similar to free jazz revolution in the 60s or punk revolution in, in late uh, 70s in Poland in 80s and I, and I uh, still think it, it is not possible <laughs> because uh, now we have a specific time in, in, in popular music, in popular co culture, mm, there is a full of uh, retro micro genres with the ironic approach to the to the past. So I think now is, just like I said in my presentation, uh, it, is not it is impossible to create something um, strong and uh, universal for all people and something uh, significantly um, recognizable uh, in pop culture like, uh, for example, Yas in uh, 90s. That's all. So thank you again very much for your brilliant presentation on relationship between freedom of music from system and freedom in music. So probably we have some questions from Polish colleagues. Comments. So, you know, uh, I, I have some two short questions. Uh, one is uh, about the 90s, uh, which was a very special epoch. Your, your uh, phenomena, music phenomena you presented started in the 80s, and, and, and in the 90s it was something like culmination of your, of your crea creative activities. So and the 90s was really a very special epoch now already, some uh, historical distant past. But in that time, new hierarchies and new images were formed extensively and it was some you know recontextualization of all the hierarchies before 1990. Uh, how the reception of this uh, jazz generation of 80s, it's the same epoch as punk, yes, generation changed in our century? I mean reception you mentioned the uh, reception of, of generation of 60s and how now new generations are just reconsidering their activities. Uh, how they see, the, for example, the jazz from 80s, yes? Yeah. <laughs> it's, still a, it's still a little bit uh, treated with the irony, I think, uh, because in 80s, in general, we have... Uh, something like a, a fusion uh, and something like a, a smooth jazz. So the jazz uh, it goes to, to uh, pop culture, I think. Uh, so for the real jazz musicians, the, especially these musicians who, uh, who feel uh, artists, uh, probably the jazz from the 70s and from 80s, in, it's not really jazz. So uh, I think in uh, our century we also uh, have um, this uh, approach, this this attitude to the uh, past and to this decade, seventies and eighties. For example, in uh, we we can see this in also in the young uh, bands and young musicians. They still. Uh, try to do something like uh, Polish uh, jazzmen from the 60s, but they, they don't try to use uh, the, the style of uh, fusion, for example, or, or, or smooth jazz, just like I said, from the uh, 80s. It's a, uh, very specific because um, there, is a, um, uh, there is a different situation, for example, in popular music. If... Uh, uh, we can see now that nowadays uh, music from 80s and even from the beginning of the 90s, it's very, it's very popular, but not in a direct sense, but of course in ironic sense, just like I said before, it's uh, 
Now it, we, we, we have time of uh, retro genres, but we still don't have this in jazz. So mm, probably there is a, there is a, mm, still some empty space, some, mm, some uh, I don't know, so we still don't have a good uh, reception of uh, jazz from 70s and 80s. It's still, um, just like I said in my presentation, uh, not exactly uh, the modern jazz. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, many um, musicians, of course, but they are, just like I said before, old masters. So it's, uh, you know, it's something like, uh, maybe I should say trivialization in the jazz, in, in the Polish jazz in general. I'm not sure, but I think I could make some, some, some thesis like this. Okay, and one more question. Uh, one of area of your studies is uh, rock music and metal rock and, and others. Uh, it would be interesting you to compare the uh, changes or transformation of rock and jazz scene from uh, 80s to 90s. Mm -hmm. In the yeah. context of freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is also very significant because uh, in the 80s uh, we have a lot of uh, rock, uh, especially punk uh, groups, but it was also, um, um, this also the underground scene, I could, stay, I, I could say, and very, um, uh, all the people from the scene was very op opposed to the, the system uh, and that's why in the 90s and everything is possible and every door was open i think uh, the punk lost the, their importance the lost their um, rebellion character lost their uh, lost their strength uh, but there is a, a specific uh, scenes that uh, grows in a, 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 a strange, uh, that was metal, of course. Uh, I'm not sure why mm, uh, in Poland uh, in uh, early 90s, there was a, a whole mm, a scene um, like gra grunge, American grunge, because it's also mm, modern, I think, for for at uh, this time and uh, in rock in general in, uh, in in Poland in the mainstream of rock I should say uh, in the mainstream uh, in Poland we ha we have also uh, something like a second boom but uh, but uh, this is completely different music compared to the uh, rebellion 80s. So when we talk about uh, rock from 80s and 90s, even even about mainstream of uh, of rock, uh, there is a total different uh, situation. In in 90s we have uh, international um, international companies, industries. We have uh, growing. Um, hypertrophic uh, uh, of um, show business. We have MTV, television, music. So this is, uh, I, I could say, complete, uh, this is a new era for uh, rock uh, in Poland. Uh, but in, a, in essence, uh, in, a, in a message, there was also, of course, uh, different. I, I, I think uh, now uh, rock from the 80s is still like... Uh, um, we have in Poland something like a mythology of uh, of rock from the eighties, especially uh, especially punk. So I think there is lots of difference between jazz scene and rock uh, rock scene. Probably we uh, we we should also separate the um, always underground and of uh, always modern uh, scenes like metal scene or uh, trash metal or for example black metal which is very important in Poland uh, at the late uh, 90s but I think we should uh, treat this uh, separately. 
So thank you very much again. And now we have uh, a last paper in our session, Ivona Sovinska Fruktrunk, uh, also music theorist from the Academy of Music uh, in Krakow, and she will enlarge our knowledge of uh, expression of freedom in music with a paper, The Idea of Freedom in Krzysztof Penderecki Works, From Experience to Expression. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, the outline of my presentation, uh, I will just show you on that slide and I will start um, uh, immediately talking about the difficult uh, freedom. Uh, the discussion of freedom is complex in general and it becomes even more complex uh, when we try to apply that concept uh, to art and music. As Mortimer J. Adler writes, the number of problems the variety of doctrines and theories, the range of issues and the types of arguments, all that makes freedom a very difficult concept to analyze. Nevertheless, Adler proposes three main subjects uh, of controversy in freedom discussion, so-called circumstantial freedom, acquired freedom and natural freedom. Circumstantial freedom uh, depends on the external factors, a fact um, that was shared by many philosophers from Aristotle through uh, Rousseau, Voltaire, to Hegel, Burke and Freud, just to name a few. And although the variety of senses in which the word freedom was understood by them, the term circumstantial meant the same thing, described at the best as neutral. The external conditions may be preventing or facilitating contradicting, contracting, or expanding the opportunities. And as Adler observes, usually the authors of theories of circumstantial freedom call for the reforms or changes in the environment. In the contrary, the authors elaborating on acquired freedom seek to reform man, not society or environment. According to Plato, Seneca, Luther, Leibniz, Russell, among others, that is freedom given only to people who have developed a certain state of mind or character. Finally, natural freedom is inherent to all men, regardless of the circumstances and without regard to any state of mind or character. Furthermore, Adler proposes to distinguish three modes of self that carry with them the ability in which freedom is thought to consist. The um, self-realization, that means an individual circumstantial ability to act, uh, self-perfection, um, acquired ability, and self-determination, a natural ability to determine what uh, we wish to become or to be. There are also certain relation to observe between the modes of self and modes of possession uh, of freedom, uh, among them uh, also circumstantial, acquired, and natural, that uh, first to may be a self-realization or self-perfection, or the natural is always uh, a self-determination. Uh, so before we move strictly to musical issues, I will shortly present the two concepts of liberty uh, by Isaiah Berlin, which I would like to then um, base on uh, my paper. Uh, it is important to remember that freedom was never purely philosophical matter. It was always somehow associated with politics. Uh, one of the most influential works on that matter is Two Concepts of Liberty by uh, Berlin, originally given as a lecture in Oxford in 1958. The author distinguishes two major types of freedom, negative and positive. Generally speaking, negative freedom is a matter of which doors lie to open to you and uh, it is concerned exclusively with opportunities, while positive freedom is a question of whether or not you can go through the doors, whether you are master of your life. Berlin also points out that historically the concept of positive freedom has been used to control and repress individuals in the name of liberty. He states that the negative sense is involved in the answer to the question, what is the area within which the subject, a person or group of people, is or should be left to do or be what he's able to do or be without interference by other people? The second is involved in the answer to the question, what or who is the source of control of interference that can determine someone to do or be one thing rather than another? 
Therefore, we should call positive freedom as freedom to and negative as freedom from. Although used by Berlin in political sense, these two kinds of freedom may be applied to musical art as well. According to Mieczysław Tomaszewski, there are four kinds of involved musical creation, authentic, musica vera, rhetoric, musica conventionalis, hyperbolic, and panegyric. Additionally, the factors that play an important role are the specific moment of creation, certain determination or historical circumstances, then attitude of the composer and the aspect of playing with the listener as well. Uh, authenticity could be seen then in another light, not only as a feature of musical work, but as a status and disposition in terms of artistic and socio-political freedom of a composer. It is also crucial when talking about politically engaged music uh, to remember the words of Alfred Schnittke, uh, quote, when you do something to react against a rigid system, the product loses its authent authenticity. Rather, one has to act as though the system doesn't exist at all. That's the only way music continues to be uh, viable in the longer term, end of quote. There is a vast number of literature devoted to the issue of witness. However, we sometimes tend to forget that being a witness does not automatically mean, mean to give testimony. The act of being involved requires being a participant, which does not exclude being a witness at the same time. And true participation is possible only in Tomaszewski's mode called musica vera. Uh, musica conventionalis, uh, more naive than cynical and falsa, do not imply engagement, or rather observing with distance that is not even conscious. Alexei Yuchak observes still another mode, which he calls internal emigration. Quote, unlike emigration, internal emigration captures precisely the state of being inside and outside at the same time the inherent ambivalence of this oscillating position, end of quote. All the above mentioned uh, requires analyzing any politically involved art in two basic ways, as an expression of liberation in purely musical terms and as an expression of liberation in human dimension. Um, so uh, just to uh, some the positive freedom uh, named as freedom to, that means acting regardless of obstacles could be um, uh, paraphrased, let's say, in musical terms as to act, being composed, to choose all the material, the kind of technique, to name, to give a special title or dedication that can be also understood in politically uh, engaged terms, to convey, message and to express. And then negative freedom would be also like uh, restraining uh, oneself from doing all this. Then uh, um, we mean, uh, we have a, a situation of being a witness and a participant, that means being involved, being only a witness, uh, observing. And then um, the, the uh, natural freedom described by Berlin uh, versus circum circumstantial or acquired freedom. And finally, the Musica Vera uh, by Tomaszewski as opposed to all three other kinds that he was proposing. Uh, coming back to um, Krzysztof Penderecki, I would like to focus quickly on the three values of natural freedom that are present in many of his uh, works. And those three values uh, I uh, allowed myself to, to name elevating, supporting, and commemorating. Penderecki's stated aim as a self-conscious avant-gardist in the early 1960s was to liberate sound beyond all tradition. Then, as Peter Schmelz reports, Quote, many of the unofficial composers reacted against the perceived confines of their earlier abstract compositions and turned to more mimetic representational styles. They moved from serial techniques to aleatory devices and a range of familiar tonal gestures and harmonics, including direct quotations of familiar compositions from the past. Moreover, they often juxtaposed the, the, the divergent styles aligned with these various techniques to narrate uh, very detailed plots, end of quote. Many years later, Penderecki wrote, quote, I 
all the time for creation of universal language, which would allow me to compose music in natural way, just as I feel it without constraints, without any pressure of environment and place in which I live. Composer should feel free, end of quote. Being honest to himself and to his art is possible only if we speak about self-determination. Self-realization and self-perfection could never stand alone for achieving such goal. And self-determination is a feature of natural freedom. Regina Chłopicka observes that in Poland's difficult historical and political situation, both religious rights and artistic activity acquired a patriotic function. They were used to defend universal and national values and create a symbolic space for fostering freedom of thought. Penderecki does not only place Poland in European culture, but emphasizes also the role of its ancient roots and Christian spiritual formation. And the example of elevating uh, Tedeum from 1979 80. Penderecki wrote, quote, Tedeum and especially Requiem is summing up my evolution and at the same time summing up everything that happened in music around this time, end of quote. Mieczysław Tomaszewski writes that Penderecki always reacted to human's fate and historical events with responsivity of a barometer. This time was, uh, it was indeed a special moment from both human and historic point of view, the choice of Karol Wojtyła as Pope John Paul II. Apart from the, him, the composer included an important Polish text, a fragment of song uh, Boże coś Polskę, God do hast Poland, which according to Chłopiska has religious and patriotic function in the work. It is necessary to remember also that around 1980s, this song served as an official national anthem, bringing hope for regaining freedom. Penderecki, ignoring the censorship, used original words, Ojczyznę wolną racz nam zwrócić pani, free fatherland, restore to us, O oh Lord. According to Domaszewski, this is an example of a climax through epiphany, manifestation of deeply religious music in the work an epiphany that elevates the whole nation uh, that could have only been done with some causes truly natural freedom and reacting and supporting uh, Polish Requiem. Uh, Polish Requiem was built around Lacrimosa, which was commissioned by Lech Wałęsa for the unveiling of a statue at the Gdańsk shipyard to commemorate those killed in the Polish anti-government riots in December 1970. The title was perceived uh, on one hand as a protest against the attempt to suppress national aspirations, and on the other as a broader reflection on the tragic history of the Polish nation. As Tomaszewski writes, each of Polish Requiem parts holds a special dedication directing listeners to, to, uh, thought towards places, events, and people being symbols of Polish martyrdom and heroism. Agnus Dei was composed in 1981 in memory of Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński, recordare in 1982 for the beatification of the uh, Franciscan Maximilian Kolbe, who had died in the Auschwitz concentration camp. Dies Ire, uh, in memory of the Warsaw Uprising of August and September 1944. Uh, and so on. Um, um, the composer recalled in, 19, uh, um, uh, in 2009, excuse me, composing sacral music was an expression of my rebellion. In Western Europe, I was conceived as the first composer from the Eastern Bloc writing religious works. Penderecki's attitude may be described also as reacting to tragic uh, events and supporting the remembrance uh, of the victims. A fragment of Lacrimosa from Polish Rec.
Thank you very much. <laughs> and the third um, value named as commemorating uh, is um, uh, here I have an exemplification um, by the piece uh, called Kaddish, uh, which was composed during summer 2009 to commemorate the 65th anniversary of the liquidation of Litzmannstadt ghetto, which nowadays, and the composer has already dealt with the subject of Holocaust in previous works, Brigada Śmierci and uh, Dies Ira. Kaddish manuscript was holding a special dedication removed at the first edition of the score, uh, quote, to little Abrams from which wanted to live to Polish people who were saving the Jews, end of quote. The text of the piece is a mixture coming from diverse sources, the chosen verses of Abram Citrin's poetry, a teenager who was then transported to Auschwitz and murdered there, fragments from the Lamentations of Jeremiah and the Book of Daniel, as well as the full text of uh, Kaddish Yatom. Kaddish is a hymn uh, of praises to God found in Jewish prayer services. Mourners say Kaddish to show that despite the loss of the parent, they still praise God. According to tradition, the soul must purify and the purification period for the worst of man lasts 12 months. In order to avoid the suspicion that the departed was a bad person, the son should say the prayer only for 11 months. In Kaddish, religious texts coexist with secular ones. The child's protest against death is expressed in a poetic mode, which allows to liberate oneself, at least partly, from the burden of overwhelming reality. The Jeremiah's protest is straightforward and full of rage. The quiet claim of the man in the furnace, full of pensiveness, which are filled with un unshakable faith, but rather with a slight shade of doubt in face of unimaginable experience. Each of texts contains ex explicitly or implicitly, uh, implicitly allusion to Holocaust. Penderecki stated, Composing music to Kaddish, I refer to diverse prayers of East Galicia, Ukraine, or even in Romania. I have asked my friend Boris just before his death. Mid-July, he still corrected the accents and gave me advices. He sang to me different melodies, sang to him by his grandfather, which means the tunes from at least half of the 19th century, end of quote. Regina Chłopicka comments, in Kaddish, Penderecki has joined two traditions, Jewish and Catholic, preserving at the same time their distinctiveness. Part one refers to the genre of orchestral song, and as such, it is a kind of continuation of the composer's musical language and existential character of the symphony number no. eight. Part three undertakes anew the idiom of sacred music for a cappella choir that originates from the Renaissance and Baroque tradition. And parts second and fourth refer to another tradition that are bound importantly with religious observance, Judaic. Uh, Saul Roth, elaborating on mentioned before Isaiah Berlin's two concept of liberty, states, the Jewish idea associates freedom with the state of dependence. The right of independence for individual as well as nation is essentially alien to the Jewish perspective, end of quote. For the Jews, freedom never meant a right. It has always been a power. What makes the difference between an authentic witness of the Holocaust and the composer giving a testimony or being simply a secondary musical witness? Uh, according to Giorgio Agamben, uh, we are dealing here with two dimensions of experience as delivering a testimony and as a survival. In some cases, the survival depends on determination to deliver the testimony, to ensure that the witness does not perish. Abram Citrin is, alas, not a survivor, but a real witness and participant. His words, I desire to live, although my wings are broken, expresses the conviction that life is the most precious value. The Talmud says that the whole human race originates from one man. Therefore, to save one life means to save the whole world. But to destroy one life compares to annihilation of the entire world. The following words of the young poet, yet I can see clearly the path I have tread, confirm the acceptance of gaining freedom through death. Penderecki takes a reflexive position delivering the moment of true commemoration and at the same time rendering a truly filial homage to the victims. Although full of remorse, by accepting to say the Kaddish prayer, we also free ourselves from the temptation to judge. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ivona, for remembering us that the control of memory and history is an important part of artistic expression of freedom. So do we have a question here in our AIDA hall or from the session members? So uh, we still have some few minutes until the, our lunch break. So we wanna, I would like just, I have a very short question. Uh, you really uh, uh, did some really very interesting like typology uh, of expression of positive and, and negative freedom. And you spoke about more like uh, continuation of, of um, this um, expression of uh, commemoration of past in the creation of Krzysztof Penderecki. My question would be, do the artistic strategies of commemorating uh, the past and the uh, expression of memory by Krzysztof Penderecki has changed in the course of time? Um, that is a good question. Um, you mean only in, uh, in, in Penderecki works? Um, yeah, because you, yes. you just, uh, yes. you know, some examples was from yes, the definitely. time, another from freedom. Yes, definitely. That is that is a one uh, point that I uh, would like to still elaborate on. It was, we didn't have here uh, enough time for that. That is a very interesting thing, how the, um, and that also goes together with that freedom, uh, the different, um, uh, let's, let's say, the different um, interpretation of the freedom uh, from um, freedom to express um, uh, or being politically engaged. Although Penderecki was always uh, trying to keep the distance uh, from uh, involving himself, but still, we always should think like the, the uh, parallel ways. There is music. Uh, and that is what com composer means or wants uh, to express, but also there is a purely independent way that means how that music later is used by culture, by people, and what is the resonance of that music. So those ways are always parallel, and sometimes we should really research both ways how that music exists. That means do not only feel restrained, but what the composer wishes uh, to 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 be like or to or to be um, to be heard like but yes indeed that was that freedom um, that was in fact uh, very politically present or social politically present in the in the uh, earlier works then became a more um, like a personal freedom personal freedom to choose also the music of, of the choice of the musical language and the way of commemorating um, i think evaluated also mostly with that feature that means the evaluation of the musical language that was uh, let's remember it was very often reproached to Penderecki that uh, his works are maybe too much traditional in musical language, but for me that was an example of incredibly strong uh, feeling of the personal freedom that, that he expressed and he was very, um, uh, um, very much um, bound to that. Thank you very much. If we have no more questions, I would like again to thank all three speakers, Mogosata. Oh, so moment, we have one question or comment. Please, Teresa Maleska, professor from Academy of Music in Krakow. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivona, what do you think about such interpretation of relationship, if one can say such a words, between Penderecki and freedom? That in his avant-garde period, that was freedom for music, in music. Then there was freedom uh, by music, freedom, for, uh, I mean, music for freedom. Then when you say about the um or other uh, Polish requiem and so on, so on. And then after the uh, 90s, uh, in, in 2000, he became close to freedom, but in more universal, uh, um, in, in more universal um, uh, 
space in your universal sense. Could you, could you uh, tell me something about such way of interpretation? Yes, thank you for the question. That is really um, uh, goes much together with what I said before. I think that, yes, that universality of, um, of freedom, let's say, interpretation or freedom interpretation in music uh, comes together, I, for me, with that uh, feeling of personal, personal freedom in uh, choosing the means of composing and being uh, completely uh, faithful uh, to 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 yourself yes indeed the, mm, the in the in the earlier pieces that freedom was already uh, like inside the music by the themes by the quotes used by the technical was was uh, was the very important uh, factor but later the the what we call expression what we call the expression of that personal freedom, I think, made the music much more universal and uh, understandable also without any political context, even though uh, we could still maybe find some, but that was, that was, not, the, that was not the main, main uh, subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Teresa, for remembering us or just, you know, one more category of relationship between music and freedom. We spoke about music uh, from uh, free uh, freedom of music, music, freedom in music, and now we have music for freedom. So, uh, do we have more comments or questions? Vita. Vita? Uh, yes. Um, hi, Ivana. And uh, I have two questions for Ivana and for Malgojata, because it was uh, very interesting to speak about uh, freedom of effectiveness. Uh, some of that um, uh, qualities, if, if can I see, uh, if can I say so, um, uh, was present in Lithuanian music too. But uh, can you say, for example, what is impact to our day's music of that period of that sentiment of freedom and of effectiveness. Thank you. Uh, may I op may I uh, answer as a first? Uh, um, it's a <laughs> it, that is a very difficult question. That is something I. Um, I made some research on, in fact, and um, we we have to uh, nowadays uh, the full concept of freedom uh, became completely uh, like reinterpreted, or we can still. I think we can still talk about it, but it's not completely not the same as uh, as we see on examples, for example, of uh, of Penderecki music. Um, there is not so much. Um, freedom from something, freedom became a, a value that is, uh, let's say, or it, maybe I should say it was, um, uh, um, given to everyone in a certain, ex to the certain extent. Um, and uh, so the reinterpretation, the, the approach to that, to that subject, to the value uh, uh, has become very, very different and uh, started to have completely different uh, aspects and, and nuances. And I think that is a, that is a very um, it's an enormous subject to, to, to talk about. But uh, we don't, although we have some uh, musical works that try to mm, comment uh, uh, on political aspects, the, we cannot, uh, at least that is my subjective uh, uh, point of view, we cannot uh, uh, call them as a, as, a, as a very important, let's say, works in musical history. Uh, that is not that we cannot compare them to those to those let's say monuments of the music history from before. Uh, there are more uh, uh, like um, aspects of the or comments uh, of what what's going on, uh, and um, uh, I think that uh, that is uh, where our where our uh, talk, feeling talking about the freedom from what we know from the eighties uh, or or even nine, beginning of nineties it has completely changed and it has been completely differently uh, now uh, uh, the approach is very very different by the young people nowadays they understand freedom very very differently. So Malgojata. Yes. 
Yes. Your Can comment. you hear me? Vita, thank yeah, you we hear this. you. Yes, thank you, Vita, for this question. It's very complex about sentimental and effectiveness. I remember my presentation in Krakow about nostalgia. And for many authors, nostalgia is the most democratic now category. So we can also discuss. And Ivana, I agree with you that the idea of freedom uh, was changed now. So young generation feel this category in different way. So I think it's a problem. Also in Penderecki's music. I remember meeting with Professor Penderecki in 2018 at our academy. And he stressed and he was always against something. Yeah. So very important <laughs> exactly. words. And this kind of commemorating past in music is also against new. So I think it's very complex problem and maybe very interesting for the next project <laughs> connected with changes <laughs> in notions in dictionary of music theory mm -hmm. and musicology because we have problem with definitions. So I think freedom is also a kind of such notion. So I don't know how to answer in very precise yeah. way, but the problem is hanging there. So it's very important. So thank you, Vita. And I think also Penderecki's music can, we can interpret it music of Krzysztof Penderecki in new maybe way also, taking into account the new notion of freedom. So thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much to everybody who joined this session. Uh, I have to remember when, uh, that uh, in one and a half hour we will continue our discussions on freedom with presentations of Vita Grodite and Yanis Kudinch on transition and Baltic singing revolution. And later on we will have one more keynote uh, lecture by Kevin Carnes on uh, freedom, artistic freedom, experimentation, and inner immigration and other issues in late Soviet Latvian disco uh, scene. So thank you very much and see you in one hour and a half. Bye. Thank you, Ruta, for you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. And now we will start session three. And one mark before presentations, uh, as we have uh, very limited time, I would ask uh, online listeners uh, write questions on Zoom chat. And after presentation, we will ask uh, the presenter to answer the questions. So the first presentation uh, will start uh, Dr. Vita Grodite. She is a researcher at Lithuanian Academy of Music and Theatre. Her research focuses on aesthetics and the history of 20th century music, cultural and political influences in contemporary music, and in particular, the emergence of a national identity in Lithuanian music. So she will present the presentation on theme, the imperfection of transition. So Vita, we are waiting for a presentation. Can we start? Yeah, we have a recorded presentation, and now we will start the presentation. The 90s were a time of radical changes in Lithuanian society. It was a closed and autonomous period difficult to define because of the stratified and rapidly changing social structures. Thus, the purpose of this presentation would be to retrace a musical physiognomy of the 90s through independent festivals. The atmosphere of the smell of blood, the winds of freedom and hazy timelessness was lingering in the ear, wrote art critic Virginius Kincinitis about the 90s. We could consider the 90s as the most eclectic, hybrid, full of anachronisms and even the most chaotic stage in the history of Lithuanian music. Meanwhile, the model of the previous society was stratifying and conflicting with the emerging model of the new society. 
It was simultaneously a coda of the hegemony of Soviet cultural policy in Lithuania and an introduction to the structural reorganization of the music area on the basis of democratic principles. Since 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika had worked like a plug removed from Aladdin's slump. Young Lithuanian composers and musicologists, receptive to social change, started organizing the first independent festivals in different parts of Lithuania. It was Youth Chamber Music Days in Druskininke, free sound sessions in Vilnius, Kaunas, and Panevijis, happening seminars in Anikche and Nida, New Music Festival in Kaunas, Musical Action Festival in Panevijis and Vilnius, Avant Garde Art Festival, renamed Contemporary Art Festival in Vilnius. Each festival had its own specificity. They should not uh, be seen as competing structures, but rather as a certain totality of artistic activities unique to that period and reflecting a multifast palette of creative initiatives. The period can be called in various ways the period of revolution, revolutionary performativity, according to Kastutis Shapoka, or experiments of performative nature, according to Ilme Vishnovskaita, or interactive art period, according to Maria Grinuk, a period of musical actions or intermedial actions, etc. Any of these terms would summarize the two most important features of the artistic activity at the time, the interdisciplinary character and active artistic expression involving and questioning not only the authors or participants, but also the audience. One of the most important traits of the music festivals was collective expression. Stylistically, the individualistic character of Lithuanian composers, who had never created any compositional school, acquired the traits of communal creation during that short period. That was a period in which the critical attitude seemed to have ceased to exist for a moment. Gintara Sodeika, the father of Anikshi Happening Festival, said, In fact, we all behaved very openly and positively. The wish to be together in a group was great. The opportunity to feel among like-minded people professing the same aesthetics, which until then was not permissible, not quite legal, seemed important to us. End of quotation. Vidmantas Bartulis, the founder of Kona's New Music Festival, remembered the feeling of communion, altruism of closeness, and understanding each other. No confrontation, either ideological or physical, end of quotation. The communality of artists undoubtedly reflected the political unity of the nation. The highest concentration of festivals could be seen in the period from 1987 through 1991. At that time, dissident organizations were already operating in public. The fast intellectual discussions clubs were formed and Lithuanian reform movement sides was established. Music festivals provided an opportunity to feel that emotional uplift in one's own environment, collectively, collectively practicing such forms of artistic activity that were impossible in this Soviet era, like happenings, actions and performances. The organizers of independent festivals, in this sense, could be called the leaders of the musical movement. Their personal motivations and initiatives moved the musical milieu and changed the habits of its functioning. The principle of the wave, which brought together like-minded composers, musicologists and musicians, made it possible to realize projects that would not have been realized individually and probably would not have had such reverberation. Composer Bronis Kutavich was, was the first to awaken a sense of musical communality. In a 1988 interview, he said, I have been doing Saudi's work for as many as 20 years. I have never been involved in politics. I do my job and probably the same job that the Saudi's is doing now. 
I was criticized by officials for writing the wrong music, nationalistic, for my music being about the past, history, and not about the present. They got to banning all my works from being shown on TV. So, am I not part of the scientists? End of quotation. Communality was also reflected in the fact that no festival was limited to the presentation of the works of its own generation. Without exception, even the most avant-garde musical action festival presented uh, compositions uh, of uh, Osvaldas Balakowskas, Bronius Kutavichus, Felixas Bajoras, or Algirdas Martinaitis. The emergence of composer tandems should be considered as an introduction to collective creation. In 1986, the first duo, that of Richus Majulis and Richard Ascadalis, was formed with a joint composition called Oxus Pelvis. It was the name of popular, at that time, orange-flavored soft drink. A few years later, Thomas Yuzelunas and Ginter Sudeika became a second tandem called Soyuz, so Deika use Lunas, a hybrid of their two surnames. Together they composed not only the soundtracks for the three Anikshi happenings festivals, but also a promotional video for the election of the scientists candidates to the Supreme Council of Lithuania, as well as the musical design um, for the meeting in 1980. Nine dedicated to the anniversary of Ramas Kalanta's self-immolation. Tandem creation was one of the most specific features of the sad period, especially many compositions of that kind were performed at the Musical Action Festival. In it, together with composers, group projects were presented by creators of various fields of art, actors, video artists, painters, jazz musicians, etc. Collective activity provided musicians with an opportunity to try the genre of anonymous creation, which was like a symbolic return to a stage of primitive art, or the state of art's innocence. Gintra Sudeika said, It seems to me that we awarded authorship from the very beginning. I was in favor of anonymity. Later, I found out that George Machunas was also in favor of anonymity, of the essence of the idea, but not of squabbling over the copyright or who would be getting the fees or whose surname will be at the top and the like. End of quotation. The festivals of happenings and musical actions very naturally developed a milieu for experimental creation that did not promote any specific goals. They did not have a definite number of participants, a hierarchical or administrative structure, or any summarizing manifestos. The two manifestos published at the time, those by Richard Escabalis and Gintra Sudeika, were too individual to be considered as summaries of the ideas of a single festival or a whole generation. According to Sharunas Nakas, so many things were maturing as the fruits of collective creation. All participants of the Anikshi festival, several dozen people, were taking part almost everywhere and always. The greater variety, contrast, opposition, and dissonance of the components of a festival, a concert, or an individual work was featured. The more freedom was believed to have been legitimized. Not the freedom to create, but the freedom to connect anything. The musicologist Giedris Gebschis wrote in 1988, Let's not look for special synthesis of art. Something else can be discerned here. The position of art as play with us was related to the rising hope to get out of the framework of stagnant culture. Three years have passed, and they testify to homo ludens gaining a ground with us, becoming a rational position of use, and serving as an alternative to the infamous and bitterly named Homo Sovieticus. End of quotation. The important things were the courage to take mistakes and the freedom to be 
misunderstood, said Ginter Sudeika. Such intention could be called the first so intensely expressed integration of the feeling of freedom into creation. Therefore, the value of creation at that time depended not on the originality of the form or the content, but on the extent to which the boundaries of previous creation were expanded. It is difficult to categorize or catalog works based on such an expansionist principle solely because of their specific nature, which avoided finality and seclusion. Thus, the end of the period or of independent festivals was probably related not only to the personal demotivation of their organizers or the changed economic situation, but also to the inevitable limits of expansionism. At some point, creation could no longer evolve in that direction. Having undoubtedly enriched the whole musical milieu of that time, it had to return to the issues of stylistics, to the condition of a musical artifact for sale, to refit into the forms of a work performed in public, etc. Expansionism also manifested itself in the extension of geographical boundaries. Independent festivals chose the province because happenings, performances, actions in frontal theater and a total similar genre demanded unconventional spaces. In a way, those creative tools served to conquer new spaces in a physical sense. The provinces were a more favorable space for experiments. Censorship no longer functioned there. Moreover, for experimental festivals, the amount of audiences, their participation, attention, or response was not important. In that sense, the festival were experimental musical bases that composer created primarily for themselves. For Richard Vascabales, founder of Druskinike Festival, the search for concert spaces in Druskininke was one, one of the most fun activities of the festival. It seemed to me that in Druskininke music could be played anywhere, in parks, squares and buildings, or in rooms where it had never been performed before." End of quotation. Festivals of the independence restoration period were not just a factory of ideas, they are known budgetary functioning perfectly corresponded to an era in which budget festivals fared much worse. In 1993, musicologist Le Mutelligate wrote, Chairman of the Composers' Union, Mindogos Urbaitis, knocked out by financial difficulties, managed to concoct the Gaida Festival of this year, although I am sure there were people who were shrugging. Who needed it, that ugly duckling? As I felt the unattractive moments of the festival, I could not help thinking that the events of the youngest ones fared better. Of course, they found it easier to hold festivals of their own yard by inviting their peers, excellent musicians with the help of one or more sponsors. Let them Gaida stay a festival of its own yard. End of quotation. In a text dedicated to the 60th anniversary of Bronis Kutavichus, Andrzej Chlopetsky said that Kutavichus's new archaics, born of a new special syncretism, is also one of the forms of the abandonment of music forms, like John Cage's escape into impersonal art, Stohausen's into cosmic mysticism, Lamont Young's into the denial of time, or Philip Glass's into the industrial indifference of sound formulas. End of quotation. The abandonment of music forms accompanied the entire period of independent festivals. According to Gintera Sudeika, free sound sessions declared free sound and freedom from composing with a pencil on paper. In Anikshi, we could feel completely free without even thinking too much about the content. It was just freedom of expression. At least for me, it was very important. End of quotation. 
In Lithuania, the period marked a transitional stage, a kind of a gray zone, albeit very colorful, in which the state gradually ceased to be the unique customer and buyer of art, and creators had to gradually adapt to free economic relations. This is why this period was more of an experience of time and space for Lithuanian artists, when all manipulated material was treated as a phenomenon of experience rather than of form or content. Independent festivals represented not music, life, but the creation itself, life, spontaneous, communal and anonymous, combining incompatible elements, creating in an imperfect way, performing in an imperfect way, and evaluating uncritically. Gintra Sudeika said, the result is not necessary for happening. If we compare it with an academic work, it is obvious that the most perfect happening will never be as perfect as Bach's food. Imperfection provokes tolerance. Tolerance allows one not to get attached to the result and to enjoy the process, which is especially important for happening." End of quotation. Algirdas Greimas, in his last book on imperfection, describes the aesthetic experience as the experience of time that came to a halt. In terms of time, the festivals of the 90s lasted for a very short period, but in terms of aesthetics, it was a very strong experience that stuck in the memory for a long time. It was a kind of an aesthetic stasis in which the previous system ceased to function and new possibilities opened up, but they were not yet known. It was a moment when one went out of one kind of boundaries and, after regaining independence, return to already some other boundaries. It was a brief moment of a complete sense of freedom, important precisely because it reflected a collective emotional state. The chaotic and uncertain nature of that period has long suggested that it was a period of exclusively political change. Osvaldas Balakauskas, for example, admitted that in 1988 he did not write any works. For this reason, the 90s plunged into um, oblivion fairly quickly. But with time, as Greimas said, and after it was over, that is, now, we realize the importance of experiencing the moment. It is all the more important that, despite its weak materiality and objectivity, because very few artifacts have survived, the effects experienced during that period are still alive. Gramus describes the moment of aesthesis that acts on an experience of the transformation of consciousness or the awakening of consciousness of enlightenment. It relates to all of our emotional global experiences. For Gramus, sensorial perception is the dimension in which the grasping of meaning takes place. The festivals of the independence restoration period were marked by their attraction. They chant like a whirlwind both creators, performance, participants, and spectators. They experimented with the present, pushing in the background all other important priorities that had existed before such as the search for national identity or the individual affirmation of the composers. The festivals provided an opportunity for creators to discover an authentic relationship with the creative act itself and to get closer to the nature of creation, rejecting not only the ideological but also the structural traditions. That is probably one of the main reasons why the vast majority of festivals ended very naturally after just a few years of existence. A change in the political system and the beginning of democracy seem to have abolished the raison d'être of those festivals. Thank you. Uh, hello again, and uh, thank you very much, Vita, for your uh, presentation. 
inspiring presentation. And I have question, one question. You have described the uh, musicians involved in the, in the independent festivals and actions uh, as the leaders of uh, that time musical movement. My question would be to what extent uh, this view characterizes that time reception and to what extent the change in the reception of that time? I mean, how many changes in the reception of the 90s we had? Because uh, for, I think that uh, for uh, generation of uh, young musicians, including you and me, who started our uh, professional careers in this environment of independent festivals and actions, uh, uh, also, it was very characteristic attitude and some uh, uh, importance of the generation of Kutaviches and Balakauskas to whom we looked for some future directions. And by the end of 90s, we completely disappointed that they could give us some future directions. So question would be about the changes in reception of the 90s. Yes. Yes, it, uh, it is... Um... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, it is a very good question because you know, '90s was uh, forgotten for many for a very long time. And just now, a few years ago, um, the memory of that time uh, uh, came, but with a very strong force, you know. And uh, I think uh, it uh, it is only now that we can. Um, uh, understand something. For example, I spoke with the Ginter Sudeik, uh, organizer of happening festivals, and I think just now he understood that it was so important that uh, perhaps uh, it was important to continue that, you know, but um, that 20 years or for 25 years, it, uh, it was just forgotten and not very important. So I think um, uh, what uh, Malgojata spoke about uh, uh, affect, you know, about this emotional uh, emotional moment of uh, of Polish and Lithuanian uh, uh, composers and musicologists, and uh, I think that um, at that time uh, the emotion was not very important in the creation, uh, not in politics. Uh, it is evident because it was very important, but in um, this emotion of process, emotion of happenings, emotion of performances, uh, uh, it was uh, something not very important. Even uh, Arunas Dikchus, um, founder of um, uh, Free Sound Sessions, he said, uh, it was just a joke for us. And uh, after some years, we said, no, it is not very serious, you know, and uh, we must um, return to our real compositions and real work, you know. And uh, I think that uh, now we can understand that uh, uh, that is really important, you know. And uh, because of that, uh, we have a, we have a new um, a new regard and new uh, comprehension of that time. Thank you. Yes, we have one question from the chat from John Bandevert. Yes, he wants to ask, um, I was curious about internationalism. Was there a broadening of global musical relationships during the period of festivals? John Cage came to Russia in 1980s. Any Lithuanian similarities? Uh, what is the question? Just to... He wanted to ask, uh, was there... Uh, he is curious about internationalism. Was there a broadening yeah. of global? Uh, yeah. Um, in Lithuania, um, just uh, um, George Machunas was known, uh, Fluxus and George Machunas. Uh, John Cage was known uh, also. Um, I presented uh, the, first, uh, the first paper about John Cage in 1992, I think. So... Um, it was just, you know, um, just uh, inspiration, but uh, it was not important actually um, in Lithuania at that time. At that time, it was just important what uh, what is happening now and here in Lithuania. And for many of that festivals, um, 
don't invite any um, international musicologists or com composers or um, musicians. If I may, Ruta, again, uh, I have a slightly different opinion about that. I think that, uh, of course, the roots of Lithuanian uh, action and happenings movement was uh, Fluxus tradition, but uh, we had, uh, Cage was something like an atmosphere of uh, 80s, he was known, and during this Druskininke chamber, Mm, this, uh, we had even one festival partly devoted to Cage. Vita also included, she had paper and we had conference and some concert performances. And I think that uh, John Cage was very symbolic figure of freedom for all Eastern Europe, as I know. Yes, as, um, as, uh, as freedom of expression, yeah. So we have we more, more questions. No, so the time is finished and we should close this presentation. So thank you again, Vita, for this presentation. And now we will start uh, another presentation. Also, we have recorded presentation. And uh, the pre presentation uh, would be about um, uh, Bachelor Always Sings for Freedom, the musical inspire of liberation and critic into the post-totalitarian situation in Latvia. And the presenter is Yanis Kudins. He is a professor at the Department of Musicology of the Jazab Svitols Latvian Academy of Music and his major interests in musicology include Latvian and Baltic music history in the 19th and 20th centuries, the concepts of style, modernism and postmodernism in music and art. So Yanis, we are waiting for the recorded presentation. Dear conference participants, with great pleasure I to greet everyone and I am glad that despite the difficult circumstances we can still meet and exchange views on a topic that is undoubtedly very interesting and relevant in interdisciplinary research in music and music culture. Without claiming to be a comprehensive analysis of the role of music in recent history in Latvia in various aspects in my presentation I would like to focus on two operas that are very important in national culture today in the recent historical change process and its reception nowadays. These two artifacts are, first of all, the rock opera Large Places, which gained phenomenal popularity in Latvia, 1988, and secondly, one of the most important classical opera in Latvian, The Fire and Night, which last staged at the Latvian National Opera in 1995, hence shortly after the country's liberation from Soviet occupation. Both of these operas are based on the same plot, which is significant in Latvian national culture history. However, each of these operas has played a slightly different role in the newest period. As a factual starting point in the presentation topic is premiere of the rock opera Large Places, which took place on August 23, 1988 in Riga. At that time, processes had already begun in Latvia, which later were denominated as Third Awakening, or the liberation from Soviet occupation and the restoration of the democracy. The rock opera, composed by Latvian poet Mara Zaliti Libretto and composer Zygmar Sliepinch Music, immediately gained phenomenal popularity and resonance in society in the specific processes of historical change. Now, for a small illustration, I offer a small excerpt from a rock opera staged in 1988. <laughs>
In fact, this rock opera gave rise to one of the symbolic artifacts of liberation process, which in terms of social resonance was at the same time a fact of a certain political manifestation. This, of course, pay attention to the artistic, including musical and as well as contextual aspects of this artifact. One of them is related to the story which was actualized in this way in connection with Latvia's cultural and historical experience. Large Places is an epic by Andreas Pumpurs, a Latvian poet, who to create it in the second half of 20th century, a period in Latvian historiography which denominated as the first national awakening and was characteristic of the process of civic and political self-determination of several European nations in the second half of 19th century. It is regarded as the Latvian national epic and recounts the life of the legendary hero, large places chosen by the gods to become a hero of his people. His name in translation means bear slayer and his mission is to liberate the nation from evil and enemies, which in the background are partly symbolized by the crusaders in connection with their arrival in the Baltic territories in the 13th century. What kind is origin of the mythical bear slayer? He will tell you about it immediately. It will be a small excerpt from the famous Latvian classical opera. Now please a moment your attention. Large places is widely reflected uh, in Latvian culture history. In addition, next to Andreas Pumpur's epic, there are two more very important artistic interpretation of large places theme in Latvian literature, theater, and music culture. It is famous Latvian poet Rainis theater plays the fire and night. The play is based on the epic large places by Andreas Pumpur's. Rainis borrowed plot of large places by Pumpur's epic, adding new episodes and deepening the ideological and philosophical dimension and its system of characters. Later, one of the first opera in Latvian based on Rainis drama was created during the F First World War and staged in 1921. This opera also resonated processes of historical change at the end of 20th century. However, about it little later, but now let's pay attention again to the rock opera Large Places. Poet Mara Zalit, who herself was actively involved in the processes of Latvia's liberation, chose to base the libretto for the rock opera directly on Andreis Pumpur's epic, of course, creating a text in modern language and introducing new accents in the plot and gallery of characters. As a result, in connection with the symbolic image of large places in Latvian culture, a very relevant cultural text and message was created more than 30 years ago, which played a sufficiently important role in the social and political processes of historical change. At the moment, there is an indication on the screen of how the staging of rock opera Large Places became as one of the episodes in chronology of the liberation process from the Soviet occupation in Latvia. However, it is also interesting that the creation of this cultural text took place by turning to the actualization of the experience of cultural history, thus to a certain extent to the themes and values that were once actualized in the past in previous periods of national awakenings in Latvia, is there an atmosphere of revolutionary change? Could one expect a principally new scheme, the emergence of new artistic symbols which reflects processes of historical change? It is interesting to remember and quote one of the most outstanding thinkers in Latvia, academician Jan Stradinj. 
in 1990, at the culmination of the process of historical change in Latvia, he made the following comment, I quote, Today we live in an age of national romanticism. It is as if we have returned to the times of Auseklis, Andres, Pumpur's young Latvians who lived in the 19th century. We idealize the past. This is also understandable because the basic task of the era is focused on regaining independence, emphasizing national values. But culture also means the nation's internal self-criticism. Its task is not only to highlight its mission, to convince its own and strangers about it, but also to anticipate danger, to warn about it. End of quote. It can be acknowledged that Janis Stradin's view on the processes of historical change in Latvia 30 years ago includes several notable cognitions which is useful for reflections and analysis nowadays. Therefore, we will return to these aspects in the concluding part of the presentation. And returning to the rock opera large places, its musical stylistics and expression qualities. In general, the musical score of the rock opera large places is characterized by a synthesis of elements of rock music and popular music with special emphasis on the brightness and expression of the melodic line. Thereby, certain songs from rock opera became very popular and resonated with third national awakening events in Latvia. One of the examples is the final episode, which excerpts I am currently offering to watch and listen. Did the rock opera large places make it possible to mark a metaphorical reference to the future, which, for example, Jacques Attali has written about? Probably more no than yes. The rock opera emerged in response to current events of historical change processes in Latvia. Overall, rock opera focuses on the actualization of cultural and historical values of the past. Its music reflects synthesis of rock and popular music elements and fix certain tendencies as a particular point in the past. It is permeated by a romantic pathos and a view of the present through a retrospective of historical experience. In turn, after the restoration of Latvian independence, rock opera has become one of the regular events in the last 30 years in the rituals of remembering of the official cultural memory of society in a kind of conserved, idealizing format of past events. Accordingly, the perception of the aesthetic and artistic qualities of the art artifact in the dominant public discourse is also subordinate. And in a way, it is paradoxical that after a short time, in the mid-1990s, the symbolical image of large places called for a critical assessment of the consequences of historical changes in the staging of the classic opera The Fire and Night at the Latvian National Opera Theatre in 1995. This opera by Janis Medinj, based on Raini's famous play, which is important in the cultural history of Latvia, went unnoticed in the context of the processes of restoration of independence in the second half of the 80s. It was really a paradox. In 1987, the fourth staging of the opera, The Fire and Night, was performed, but almost no one noticed it, and the image of large places triumphed in rock opera one year later. In turn, the dialogue and the metaphorical convocation between large places in two coexisting stagings did not take place. The main reason for this was due to the solution of stage production. 
This was also partly due to that during the Soviet occupation, in stagings of opera, the fire and night dominated stylized ethnography and traditionalism. It probably created a situation that in the process of historical change, it was no longer able to address the society. On the other hand, in 1995, after the liberation from the occupation and the restoration of the country independence, the first complexity of democratic system and economic crisis were experienced. In this atmosphere, the last fifth staging of opera, The Fire and Night, for the time being came as an analytical and critical reflections on the call encoded in the story of large places to learn not only to win, but also to use wisely victory. This opera production was performed by the now internationally well-known theater director Alvis Hermanis. Five main characters and symbolism in this staging offer strong contrasts with slight elements of postmodern irony. Phrase by Rainis in Latvian, Maini un mainies patsu zaukšu, in translation, change and change upwards yourself, in this opera staging was highlighted as the main motive, which in the specific situation of Latvia's historical experience reflects a self-critical view of little after the process of social and political change. This opera staging was historically the first postmodern directing theater application at the Latvian National Opera, and in a way, a bit harsh was the solution of the final scene. Choir as nation divide into pieces the map of Latvia, while the five main characters, large places, Spiduola, Laimduota, Kangars, and Dark Knight in fight for freedom remain without a clear solution. At the moment, I invite you to watch a small excerpt from the final of this opera last staging 25 years ago. Oh, yeah. 
and some concluding remarks. The appearance of large places image in the processes of historical change in Latvia draws attention to the strong actualization of the cultural and historical values of the past. This is reflected in rock opera in a somewhat romanticized stylistic synthesis of rock and popular music of that time. In his year, such modern national romanticism and retrospectivity, a unique case of Latvia, possibly the Baltic states, in the process of political and cultural change 30 years ago. Go. In such processes of historical change elsewhere in the world, is it more characteristic to create new images and look for new forms of artistic expression, not through new artifacts mainly actualize the symbols created in the past? At the moment, I can only ask these questions because synchronic and diachronic comparison of the many and different situations of historical change has not yet been made. Interestingly, that one of the first classical opera in Latvian, staged only a few years after the restoration of Latvian independence, not only reflected the pathos of revolutionary change, but also offered a strong message about the complexity and infinity of the process of liberation. Opera, The Fire and Night, did not gain so large socio-political resonance as the rock opera, Large Places. However, the text which created at the beginning of 20th century and music which represents style of late romanticism at the end of this century in a new, artistically provocative form turned out to be more as a metaphor with a view of the unknown future successfully resonating with the present and actively asking where to go next. Of course, the last question is quite rhetorical, and the search for answers remains open. Analyze of the past with different approaches and illuminated new aspects of this process. Thus, in the hope of fruitful further research into these aspects, I am grateful that you listened to my report. Thanks for attention. Thank you, Yanis, for a very interesting presentation. And now the time for the questions. And uh, we have one question, question from Kevin Karnes. Can we unmute? First, first thank you for your, your presentation. Yes, it's, yes, yes, it's fascinating and, and a fascinating topic. And um, my question is just, I, I've, I've always wondered kind of how the rock opera originated uh, because it's such a large production. And was this simply an artistic project that Zolit and Leah Pinch just dreamed up together one day or, or did this come out of some larger um, conversations from some larger groups of artists or potentially yes. of, of activists in the, in the awakening or, or, or what are the origins of, of that project in itself? Yes, this uh, project basically um, was uh, produced by um, many rock groups at that time. Of course, uh, many of Latvian uh, famous uh, soloists in popular and uh, rock music at that time. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this was a very uh, unique project, of course, at that time. And Mara Zalit wrote, uh, wrote um, uh, sometime after that, uh, uh, this uh, project was um, originated and premiere as uh, a date of premiere 23 August uh, chosen especially because it is historical uh, uh, historical memory about uh, this date for three uh, Baltic states but of course for uh, for uh, for more detail um, answer uh, is possible is possible <laughs> a, a little time because it is of, of course uh, one unique a project at that time was yes of course mm -hmm. yeah. thank you thank you have been more questions from the audience in the hall yes we have Beata Bublinski no? uh, thank you Janis for your presentation very interesting uh, paper and I would like to ask, uh, uh, we, we saw that uh, rock opera last time was staged two years ago, yes, in uh, 2018, and uh, opera by Medinsch was staged uh, 25 years ago. So yeah. in your opinion, what, what are the reasons why? 
Why? Uh, from one part, the reason is uh, very simple, because last staging of rock opera was dedicated to centenary <laughs> year of uh, Latvian uh, uh, independence. Yes, yes uh, three Baltic states uh, celebrated the centen uh, centenary uh, in uh, two years ago, and in Latvia, one of cultural event was a new staging uh, of uh, rock opera large places. Uh, from the um, uh, other hand, of course, this question is, uh, uh, is um, a little difficult because it is uh, a very Mm, uh, very, um, uh, very interesting that uh, opera of uh, Janis Medinc is very bright, is very historically important for Latvian co culture. Maybe uh, it is very interesting for international audience, but it is a, a very a difficult task for staging because Janis Medinc opera uh, represents so-called um, uh, Wa uh, Wagner style, and uh, for staging of this opera is necessary. Um, uh, so-called uh, Wagnerian singers, and it is a difficult task for our uh, national uh, opera theater <laughs> nowadays. Thank you, and we have one more question. So thank you, Yanis, again. You know, I have one strange question. You know, when listening to you, I was absolutely convinced that we probably need a more deep comparative analysis of Baltic singing revolution repertoires. When I listen to Latvian rock music, Lithuanian rock music, or even Belarusian rock music from, uh, from uh, that time or in Belarus from our times, I notice the same intonations, the very similar melodic gestures, but for me, big difference between, for example, Belarusian or Lithuanian rock music and Russian music. Uh, do you feel the same, uh, some co probably com 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 possibility to compare with Lithuanian and Latvian uh, with popular music or, I don't know, probably you, you could comment with my strange question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruta. Very interesting question. Unfortunately, um, I am um, not specialist of rock and popular music, and I choose rock opera large places for uh, this conference and for my presentation because uh, this rock opera reflects the image of large places in the uh, Latvian uh, cultural history. But of course, for my opinion, it will be very interesting interesting uh, topic and maybe very interesting uh, um, uh, and a very interesting project uh, uh, to compare uh, processes in um, different musical genres in La in three Baltic st uh, states at that time at that time uh, time of change um, about uh, 30 years ago but of course uh, uh, unfortunately I'm not a uh, big specialist of popular and and rock music so Sorry, of course. Uh, in just a moment, of course, yes. Thank you, Yanis, for the answer. Have we more questions? Angie. Yes, you have a question from Angie Mondro. Um, he wants to ask, uh, could you identify the main inspirations for, for musicians, for example, the classics of the genre? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for questions, uh, but it is necessary to um, precise this is question about popular and rock music. Oh, 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 yes, Andrzej, or not? Yes, uh, sorry, I am uh, not a <laughs> big specialist of rock and popular music. Uh, sorry, yes, I, I, uh, I, I, I gave answer to this uh, question uh, and clarified it uh, a, little a little before. <laughs> sorry, yes. Have we more questions? Yes, we have from the audience. I Austin So maybe you could uh, say more about the main performer, the yeah, about him, his relations with the liberation movement. He was big star or 
why this opera was popular. Who was the main star, the biggest star <laughs> at, at those times? Uh, thank you. As, um, in, uh, in main role in uh, the rock opera um, uh, performed by famous uh, Latvian uh, popular music uh, singer Rodrigo Fomins, or his stage name is Igo. And at that time, um, uh, Rodrigo Fomins uh, represents um, uh, himself in, um, in, in uh, different uh, musical projects and, and musical and in some musical uh, groups, uh, he was uh, youngest. <laughs> yes, uh, is, is, he was uh, very young, and um, uh, it, it is one of uh, reason for this uh, rock opera popularity and uh, the popularity of staging of this rock op opera because Igo was a famous young singer at that time, and uh, he represents image of large places, and I. Mm, I characterize this image in my presentation because the image of large places is very important in Latvian culture. He reflects national uh, culture, history, mm, and, uh, and, and it is, of course, uh, um, uh, very, mm, uh, very good reason for popularity. Yes, these two aspects, uh, young, famous uh, uh, singer, musician, and, of course, image of uh, large places or bears layer. Thank you, Yanis. You are very popular. <laughs> we have one more question from uh, from John Vandevert. Yes, uh, he writes. Just a question: Is Fire and Night popular outside of Latvia because of its nationalistic uh, qualities? Would one assume that it has a distinct audience in mind? Is this opera shelved or still performed? Um. Uh, a very, very good question, and it is um, a very uh, important question for uh, Latvian um, music history, and for uh, it is very um, interesting and very important question for uh, Latvian uh, music history researchers, uh, because opera, the fire and, uh, and night, of course, from one part represents uh, very strong. A national, a national awakening message. But from the other hand, uh, the plot of this opera is based to the uh, Rhine's uh, theater play, and uh, Rhine's theater play and text of um, uh, theater play and in opera uh, also represents um, a very uh, symbolical and philosophical message. It is not only uh, uh, a nation, national message, but it's very complicated uh, philosophical message which represent texts and uh, plot of theater play and uh, of uh, and libretto of opera, The Fire and Night. And from um, my opinion, this opera of course, um, of course, uh, it is uh, potentially very interesting for international, uh, for international uh, audience, and maybe for uh, staging outside of Latvia. Uh, but um, until today, it is um, it is not realized. <laughs> so. Uh, it is uh, open, of course, uh, a question why, but uh, qualities and text and, and, and plot of this opera is uh, a very provocative and very interesting, of course, yes, and very complicated. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation because our time is, time is finished. And now we will have coffee break and uh, we will meet after 25 minutes. And we will have keynote lecture uh, from Kevin Karnes uh, and he will talk about disco culture and the ritual journey in the Soviet 1980s. So it would be very interesting to listen. So see you. Good afternoon, everyone. I was going to say good morning to Kevin Karnes. Uh, hello, <laughs> Kevin. But I seen that you joined us very early, even pre before lunch, yes, break. 
So, so the uh, last speak we have today is the keynote lecture by Kevin Carnes, a musicologist professor at Emory University. And uh, he pre-recorded for us his keynote lecture. Uh, we will play it, but uh, he will join us for discussion. And only a few words I have to say that Kevin Carnes is historical musicologist who studies sounding expression of identity, difference and belonging in Eastern and Central Europe from 19 to 21st centuries. And the title of his keynote lecture is Disco Culture and the Ritual Journal in Journey in Soviet Union of 1980s. So now we have uh, this recorded keynote lecture and a later final discussions of this first day of conference. The guru is the busy guru, never be the obvious. The two zini, the seed, 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 the two zini, the seed. In order to understand these things we're doing, it's necessary to put yourself in a different kind of place. And that requires effort, working with oneself. Clarifying what's essential to you is not something possible in everyday life. These words were penned by the DJ and artist Hardy's Ledinch in 1988, at a time when his Riga discotheque, called Cosmos, was drawing audiences of young people from throughout the city and from as far away as Moscow and Yerevan. He was referring to his disco project itself and also to the project of performance art that underlay so much of his work. Those foundational performances took the form of an annual ritualized pilgrimage he made with the poet Joris Boyko from his Riga home to the forsaken coastal suburb of Bolderaya, following 10 kilometers of railroad tracks. These Bolderaya walks supplied the metaphysical substance to nearly all of Ledinch's artistic explorations of the period and his discotheque Cosmos was their most publicly outward-facing manifestation. In sound and light, in dancing and listening to Ledinch's disco presentations on topics ranging from postmodern architecture to new wave music, the DJ offered attendees a thrilling taste of the imaginary elsewhere that inspired so much of alternative youth culture in the late Soviet Union. But in contrast to the dance parties and group listening sessions documented by the anthropologist Terje Tomistu and others, Ledinch's Cosmos did something else as well. It brought into the disco hall itself echoes of a distinctly Soviet strain of experimentalist performance art, which regarded the ritualized journey beyond the city as a means of experiencing expressive freedom and spiritual transformation. His achievement, and what made his discos so extraordinary, consisted in conjuring a sense of that experimentalism and a hint of that freedom within the city itself, in a disco space of community making that was readily accessible to all. Underpinning my study of Ledinch's disco are a number of theoretical claims, which I'll elaborate over the course of this talk. But right here, from the start, I'll head ahead to my key point in this presentation. It would, at first glance, be easy to dismiss Ledinch's disco project as an attempt to appropriate and assimilate forms of Western culture into a Soviet space. But he was not, in fact, attempting such things at all. In fact, as we'll see, he understood his disco as an experiment in communality specifically as a means of experiencing, at least for an evening, the enlightening promise of Soviet socialism that was undelivered by the state itself. In framing this case, I draw upon work by the, anthropolo uh, the anthropologist Alexei Yurchak, who stresses in his writing on Soviet artists that many creative individuals remain profoundly committed to the very ideals that had animated the Soviet socialist project in its earliest revolutionary days, even into the 1980s, and despite the dramatic failings of the Soviet state. 
For a great number of Soviet citizens, Yurchak writes, many of the fundamental values, ideals, and realities of socialist life, such as equality, community, selflessness, altruism, friendship, ethical relations, safety, education, work, creativity, and concern for the future, were of genuine importance. For many, socialism as a system of human values and as an everyday reality of normal life was not necessarily equivalent to the state or ideology at all. Indeed, he continues, living socialism often meant something quite different from the official interpretations provided by state rhetoric. This sense of dissonance, this yawning chasm between the enlightening promise of Soviet socialism and the reality of what the system had actually produced, might well have been the defining feature of daily life in the Soviet 1980s. And yet, as Yurchak also notes, the ethos of Soviet revolutionary socialism survived in various forms in mundane Soviet life, even during late socialism, and in spite of the stagnant bureaucratic party system. One place where it survived was informal, that is, alternative, Soviet art. Among such art forms where those ideals survived were Ledinch's discos and walks to Bolderaya. His collaborator Boyko put this plainly in an interview with a West German art historian in 1988. What then is socialism? Boyko asked rhetorically. It is social life, he answered. It is active contacts between individuals. In the remainder of this presentation, I will sketch the origins of Ledinch's disco project, drawing on oral history and the store of documents preserved in the Ledinch collection of the Latvian Center for Contemporary Art in Riga. Then, bringing these materials into dialogue with the archive of recordings maintained by the Ledinch family and curated online by the Riga-based musician Laurus Vorslavs, I will point to some ways in which his ritual walks intersected with his musical activities beginning in 1980. Finally, I will consider his disco project as it evolved between that point and mid-decade, unfolding something of the way in which his performance art inflected his disco operation in those years. Throughout the 1980s, Ledinch's discotheque remained a space for dancing. But more importantly, as he himself believed, it became a space for awakening attendees to the spiritually transformative potential of being open to the experience of their surroundings, and also for achieving and maintaining the active contacts between individuals that Boyko described. Put simply, Ledinch's disco was a venue in which socialism could be practiced as many felt it was meant to be, in contrast to the dispiriting reality encountered just outside its doors. It was an idealistic project, to be sure. But to give the last word once more to Boyko from that same interview of 1988, you could say that it is the artist's mission to prepare for the future, and that means bringing a utopian element into the here and now. Hardy's Ledinch, born in 1955, died in 2004 came of age in a peculiar nexus of generational sensibility, social niche, and family culture that led him to expect that he could do pretty much whatever he wanted to with his life. His mother, a translator and journalist with ties to state security, raised him reading both English and German, and she supplied him from early on with electronic equipment and recordings she acquired from abroad. His lifelong collaborator, the poet and musician Juris Boyko, did not enjoy such privilege. When Boyko and Ledinch got busted in high school for distributing among students a satirical homemade journal called Zirgobwals, Latvian for horse shit, Ledinch's mother got her son off the hook while Boyko was sentenced to military service. Upon graduation, Boyko shipped off to the army while Ledinch moved across town to the prestigious Riga Polytechnic Institute where he studied architectural theory. Midway through the 1974-75 academic year, Ledinch made a splash on campus as organizer and DJ of a discotheque sponsored by the Polytechnic Student Club, which made its home in a disused Anglican church in Riga's old town. With plenty of time devoted to dancing, his discos also featured listening sessions, as well as lectures by the DJ and guests, and occasional live performances of jazz, classical, and avant-garde music. Some of his discotheque events were remarkably ambitious. 
Drawing on personal and possibly family ties, and eagerly exploiting such state infrastructure as a long-distance phone line in the office of a friend, Ledinch was able to bring to his discos a remarkable array of esteemed musicians and radical newcomers from throughout the USSR. Here, in a photo from 1976, we see Ledinch on the right, before he grew a beard, seated behind a turntable with the Moscow-based composer Vladimir Martinov. Here, at another disco event from that year, the celebrated pianist Alexei Lyubimov consults with the only slightly less famous violinist Tatyana Grindienko. And here, also in 1976, we see Lyubimov, the bald man, looking more or less straight ahead. On the left-hand side, with the big black beard, Arvo Pert looks on. By all accounts, interviews with participants and former administrators protocols of the Polytechnic Komsomol, and reports in the Polytechnic student press, Ledinch's discos were not only wildly popular with students, but also highly regarded by university officials, whose faith in the educational value of his programs was such that he was supported with no close oversight whatsoever. But of course, this was the USSR, and there were still limits. In October 1977, after hosting the underground premieres of a pair of openly sacred works of music, Martinov's Passions Leader and Arval Pert's Misa Syllabica, Ledinch was accused of spreading religious propaganda and his disco operation was temporarily shut down. The locus for such concert organizing shifted northward to Tallinn, where it continued without him for another year. Meanwhile, Ledinch graduated, reunited with Boyko, and turned in another direction. At three in the morning in late November 1980, Ledinch, Boyko, and an architect friend departed Ledinch's Riga home and followed the train tracks to Boldoraya. They walked into the sunrise. Along the way, they drank tea, took photographs, and paused frequently to take in what they encountered. When they arrived, they bought a bus ticket back home. In June of the following year, they repeated their walk. In January 1982, they did it again. Their treks evolving into an annual pilgrimage, they took on ritual trappings. The walkers ate hard-boiled eggs at pre-times intervals. They left mementos for themselves along the tracks. Reflecting later about what they were after, Ledinch described his walks as an exercise in spiritual renewal, as a kind of new religion, yauna religia, he called it. Boldoraya, he later explained, was in fact a terrible place, with the train tracks littered with industrial detritus, passing by metallurgy shops, skirting a shipyard where they broke down old warships. But in its very awfulness, he reflected, it was like the Christian catacombs, which inspire a new kind of sensitivity to life. Boyko, in turn, described the Boldoraya walks as an extension of their contemporary interest in avant-garde music. Stockhausen's ideas, Cage's ideas, he recounted, we grasped those ideas viscerally. In the Boulderia walks, we were simply seeking their substantiation in the surrounding reality. Other comparisons are revealing as well, perhaps none more so than the so-called Journeys Beyond the City, Poyezdki Zagorod, organized by the Russian poet Andrei Monastirsky and his so-called Collective Actions Group beginning in 1976. Together with his artist friends and a rotating handful of invited guests, Monastirsky would travel to some unfamiliar, uninhabited place beyond the Moscow suburbs. There, visitors would witness a deliberately ambiguous activity performed by one or more members of the group. The first such action, called appearance, consisted solely of artists crossing a snowy field and handing certificates to visitors. Sometimes following written instructions, guests would participate in the unfolding of the action. Afterwards, they would be asked to reflect and record their impressions of what had taken place. Deeply moved by his encounters with the Zen-inflected writings of John Cage, Monastirsky described his journeys as quasi-spiritual events or rituals. Their goal, he explained, was to effect a change in perception and self-reflection on the part of participant observers. To make extraordinary the perception of ordinary things, 
he wrote in 1980. The following year, Monastirsky explained, Our activities are spiritual practice. If it is indeed possible to consider our work as art, then only as a tuning fork for directing the consciousness outside the boundaries of intellect. For his friend Boris Groys, the foremost philosophical interlocutor for Monastirsky and his group, their journeys beyond the city evoked a world opened up by religion, a world that opens itself to us through the medium of art. Like the members of Monastirsky Circle, who memorialized their journeys in photos and written recollections, Ledinch and Boyko documented their walks to Boulderia in a variety of ways. They took photographs, often framed or modified artistically. Sometimes they brought along a boombox, not to accompany their walking with music, but to record the ambient soundscapes through which they traveled. During their journeys, they also wrote poetry. This one, titled A House in Boulderia, pictures an impossible home in an imaginary locale, without doors or walls, from which they would sell passers-by bus tickets to another Boulderia. This one, called The Ballad of Deep Boulderia, implores anyone and everyone, a full-on imaginary menagerie of freaks and misfits, to take the journey with them. If you have galoshes on your feet but someone else has wooden legs, no matter, take them with you to far-off Boulderia. If someone's deaf and cannot hear those wooden legs clacking along, then let them walk without hearing to soundless Boulderia. And if someone cannot walk because they don't have legs, then put them on a stretcher and head to Boulderia. Now, where all this comes back to music and the disco project for which Ledinch would eventually become famous, despite the student club interruption, was the strange and unlikely intersection of these Boulderia activities with another sphere of Ledinch's creative engagement, one that involved a hands-on working with sounds, ideas, and technologies that he and Boyko were simultaneously gathering from abroad. Often, as the art historian Amy Brisgell notes, experimental artists in late Soviet spaces used art they encountered from the West as a resource for wholly new imaginings, rather than as a literal source to be referenced in their work. Inspired by artists they encountered from elsewhere, she writes, they created their own distinct forms of creative expression. As we'll see, Ledinch was a case in point. But he was also something else. His gift, to extend the suggestion made by the Latvian historian Ivars Iyabs, consisted in spotting and then mining the cracks that appeared across the bureaucratic facade of Brezhnev's Soviet Union. He exploited the opportunities for creative engagement they afforded in order to explore the newness of things trickling in from the West, yet always navigating within the distinctly Soviet artistic spaces he traveled. It's true postmodernism, Eobs observes of Ledinch's art, playing within the chasm between the provincial culture of the USSR and the global normality of the West, smuggled in from abroad. Here is what I mean. All the way back in 1974, Ledinch had started playing with tape when his mother procured for him a reel to reel deck. Hearing Lyubimov and Grindienko performing Cage and Stockhausen in Riga inspired him to turn to composition. I went home from their concert and decided that I too needed to try my hand at preparing a piano, he recalled. I stuck in pieces of paper, erasers, pins and scissors, and it sounded just like Lyubimov. After Boyko was discharged, he and Ledinch passed the remainder of the decade recording dozens of tapes of their experimentalist compositions, all in the freely improvisational spirit of Stockhausen and Cage. And they called their outfit Sekve, a nonsensical yet distinctly foreign-sounding word. But then, just days after they returned from their first walk to Boulderia in November 1980, they recorded something else something radically different from what they'd done before. It was an album of songs, all in simple pop-like arrangements, entitled Boulderia Style, 
most of which setting the poetry they composed along their walk. Track number one on the album is, is entitled A House in Boulderia, setting the poem I mentioned a minute ago where they imagined selling bus tickets in a house without walls or windows. Track number seven is Deep Boulderia, that poem I read where they invited a ragtag group of the deaf and the legless to join them on their trek. During this time, Ledinch was employed as an architectural theorist, but he seems to have spent nearly every available waking minute studying everything he could find about Western music. The music of Cage and Stockhausen, of course, but also, and increasingly, Western pop. In his archive, there's a document that gives a sense of the seriousness with which he approached this project. A handmade index he compiled of every issue of the British magazine Melody Maker from 1970 onward. He also collected recordings, the LPs supplied by his mom and others, as well as a store of pirated cassettes. Here's one by Laurie Anderson. Whereas Boulderia style, his first album of songs, was produced using whatever instruments and soundful objects he and Boyko had on hand, their second album of songs, set to Boulderia poetry, from 1982, shows that they had already acquired a synthesizer by that time, and they were working to mediate, with their own music, the sounds of some of what they'd been listening to. Where Ledinch went from here is interesting. Together, he and Boyko continued making music, acquiring from various sources both technologies and an understanding of recording and production techniques. Partnering with a record store, they released a flexi-disc single in 1983. This was their first recording intended for distribution beyond their narrow circle, a thing still technically illegal at the time. The sound quality of the recording is terrible, but it gives you a sense of how far they'd come in just a year since the track we just heard. With recordings like this, the music of Ledinch and Boyko soon became a staple on Riga's disco scene, which was among the most vital in the USSR. 
And shaping that scene was Ledinch himself, who had recently opened his own discotheque called Cosmos in a cultural center called October. But what made his Cosmos discotheque remarkable and likely unique on the landscape of Soviet youth culture was the manner in which he sought to bring something of the transformation in perception and consciousness that he found on his Bolderaya walks into the disco experience itself. Only a few of his disco programs are known to survive. But in those documents, we see him planning in detail the music he'd play and the visual effects he'd feature, which were interspersed throughout the evening with discussions led by the DJ himself. In this undated program, the recordings are listed on the left-hand column and the visuals in the column second to the right, next to the timings. Under the heading Texts, we see his topics for discussion. On this particular evening, after a sonic intro of cosmic effects, the DJ and an architect together discussed some planned renovations to the October Hall, where the, his discotheque was held. Then, a few words about the evening's musical selections. And then, this. The DJ invites everyone to take an imaginary walk around the environs of the October Hall, so that we may acquaint ourselves with those things in our surroundings that merit our attention. As indicated in the visuals column, this walk took the form of a slideshow with commentary by the DJ, pictures and thoughts on the hall itself, on a nearby first aid station, on the National Theater down the block, on nearby Lenin Street. At the close of the evening, after 120 minutes, Ledinch's parting remarks to his audience. The DJ thanks everyone for their attention and calls upon them in their free time, not only to think about dancing, but also to observe more closely their surroundings, their homes, other people, the things going on around them. In the quotation I read at the very start of this talk, Ledinch reflected on the significance of his Bolderaya walks. In order to understand these things we're doing, he explained, it's necessary to put yourself in a different kind of place. Clarifying what's essential to you is not something possible in everyday life. Now, in his parting words to attendees of his Cosmos discotheque, he seemed to suggest that the transformation, the shift in perception he found following the tracks to Bolderaya, was something attainable, at least in theory, by every individual at whatever place they might be. All that was needed was a change in one's way of seeing, one's way of sensing the spaces one traveled. For although he imagined in poetry and song anyone and everyone joining him on his treks, he knew that most would never experience the transfiguring terribleness of Bolderaya's catacomb-like landscapes. But hundreds came weekly to his discos, gathering together to forge and revel in the active contacts between individuals that constituted for Boyko the very definition of socialism itself. With his Cosmos discotheque, Ledinch did not strive to give attendees a taste of the West. Rather, he drew in part upon Western sounds and art forms to inspire his contemporaries to look at their Soviet world in new ways. If he could give his audience something of the Bolderaya experience in his discotheque, if he could inspire them to look at their surroundings as if anew, as spaces where encounters might likewise prove enlightening, liberating, even transformational, he would have accomplished no small feat. He would have succeeded in bringing a utopian element, in Boyko's words, into the here and now. So, Kevin, thank you very much. Probably uh, you could add something before I give floor for the audience's for questions. Yeah, uh, hello, uh, good morning, hello. good afternoon. Can, can you hear? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, first of all, I, I just wish to say thank you deeply um, to Ruta and to the rest of the conference committee for, um, uh, first of all, for inviting me to participate, and second of all, for making this happen, um, despite everything. And um, yes, it, uh, it is true. I, I woke up a little before five o'clock in the morning here uh, and uh, to catch as much of the conference as I could. And uh, you know, it's, I, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing as much of the rest as I, I possibly can. Um, I, I guess I would simply say um, that uh, uh, this, whenever I present on this material, um, uh, as I've done uh, a couple of times on, on parts of this material uh, in, in Latvia, um, and, uh, and spoken about it also in, in Estonia. Um, I, I, one of the most valuable parts of the experience for me is um, hearing from the experiences of others who uh, may have attended uh, these activities or others. Um, so much of this history and one thing which is really quite different with this project for me than many others that I've done, um, you know, so much of this history I exists in uh, informal archive spaces, um, personal reminiscences, um, oral history, uh, recollection, uh, memoir, um, and, uh, and, and this is something that I've really, like I say, it's been among the most valuable parts of, of this project for me is, is you know, sharing the, um, what I've found and, uh, and having conversations with others who uh, also experienced and participated. It's, it's not material that, that one can find walking into the National Library. Um, uh, it's, it's really a different sort of, uh, of, of archive that, uh, that, that, that I've been working in. So thank you very much for your uh, really fascinating and inspiring paper. And I hope that uh, we will have questions. So I welcome audiences. So we have already uh, one question by John uh, Vandenwert. Uh, Kevin, you see this on chat? I do, yeah. Yes, so probably I, I will not repeat it and please answer to this question. Okay, um, if anyone's watching on, on um, should I read the question? If, if people are watching on YouTube, do they have access? Mm, do you think that people on YouTube have access to chat questions? Ah, okay, so question is a uh, wonderful talk. I had a question about labeling regarding the governance on the works. When the groups were asked to do mundane activities, yeah. comment on them, did Hardis Ladins dictate the activities as fluxes inspired or happenings or were they something else entirely? Yeah. So um, about the, the Boulder Eye Walks, uh, these started just with three friends uh, in 1980, and then it actually was reduced to two friends, simply Ledinch and Boyko, for the next couple of years afterwards. Um, and, and they were um, very close friends and very close creative collaborators since they were um, in their early teenage years. Um, they were really um, you know, as close as two artists could be. Um, and uh, by their accounts, they really proceeded spontaneously. Uh, with their projects. Again, they've been working together, creating together, living together at that time uh, already for well over a decade. Um, and we're very tuned in to each other as, as creative uh, individuals and as explorers of, of, of their worlds. Um, and, uh, and they did not at first have a kind of a choreography or, or a plan for, for their walks. Um, but um, you know, over the course of, of the first couple, um, a certain you know, ritual element uh, did come into play, particularly in terms of leaving things for themselves um, along the tracks to find the following year, um, stopping at certain points to, to listen or to, to take in the scene or to take a photograph or to eat or, or have some tea. Um, over the later 1980s, uh, the walks uh, attracted some attention. Um, in particular, 
uh, I did cite from an interview from 1988 uh, with Boyko. Um, there was a large uh, exhibition in West Berlin in 1988 um, that was curated by uh, a, a West German curator who had spent some time in Riga, and this provided the uh, event for the first travel uh, by Boyko and Ledinch uh, to uh, West Germany, um, and uh, you know spent some time there and, and, and met many artists there uh, and others. Uh, and one of the things that the curator was really attracted to, in fact, was the Boulder Eye Walk. Uh, she was fascinated by the idea. She had seen some of the documentation of it. Um, and the fact that uh, some, some uh, reflections on this, so some of the poetry, uh, some of the photographs were included in the German exhibition, um, brought a lot of attention, uh, both uh, in West Germany and also um, in some uh, alternative and not so alternative art circles in uh, Latvia at that time. So in the later 19th 1980s into the early 1990s, the, the walks continued and they did become highly uh, choreographed. And uh, there are some YouTube videos, in fact, from some, I think, from like the late 90s that, that you can watch. And it's really sort of like Ledinch is leading a group of you know, 30 people uh, down the train track and stopping now and then to kind of conduct them singing a song and, and things like this. It really became a, a very different kind of a project than, than it was at first. So, if we were in person, I'd say, is that, does that answer your question? And I would see you nod or, or not, but I can't tell here. Oh, you, there is a follow-up. So follow-up a question. It's later the, the question of a, uh, a same participant, follow-up question. What do you think the benefits were that out of these works, just, not just one type of art was created? Recordings, music, poetry. Um, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to say, you know, for what the benefits were. It's just this is what he, this is the way that Ledinch existed as an artist. Uh, he he was, was always engaging um, across media, uh, always engaging collaboratively, um, you know, really a, a, a creative mind that really transcended any one particular medium, uh, I think, uh, to the end of his life. Uh, he continued uh, writing music. He also became involved with um, uh, video art uh, increasingly. Um, and Boyko was the same. Uh, he really uh, returned toward the end of his life uh, to poetry primarily, but um, was also a, a very active in the visual arts and in music, particularly in the visual arts later in his life, and uh, uh, became a very important curator of uh, contemporary art in Latvia and of Latvian contemporary art uh, for uh, uh, Germany in particular uh, in the uh, 1990s. Yeah, so I, I would like also to ask two questions. Uh, one is related to one uh, very interesting insight in your paper and I would like you to comment a little bit. It's about the less generational sensibility. And what is also interesting for me that it seems that also in the morning session, Andrzej Mondro, uh, when commenting the uh, generation of 80s and uh, the reception of generation of 80s in the 21st century, also said that it's such a generational expression, it's impossible, something like in, in our uh, new century, if you uh, could add something about that. Yeah, um, this is actually a really interesting question for me, and there, there are different kind of dimensions to this, and I guess I can, I'll comment on two and, you know, would be really happy to follow up um, you know, later in, in the conference or, or, or online or, or what. But so two things that occurred to me. One is that this was, um, uh, yes, but, I'd say yes, but. Uh, the, it was and it wasn't. Um, and so, you know, thinking back to the... Um, the, the, his first uh, experience with the discotheques. So this is in the middle and, and later 1970s when he was still a, a student at the Riga Polytechnic Institute. Um, you know, this was, this, this was a student project. And I, I think, you know, that in every environment that, that, that I've ever experienced either, um, you know, as a professor or through my research, um, you know, experience through what you can see in the archives and in, in recollections and so forth, um, the students, stu the student culture is where some of the most amazing stuff happens, right? Um, there's a sort of a sense of, 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 um, of possibility, right? I think when we're in our um, in our 20s and our, in our teens um, that is hard to maintain later in life or that is sort of 
still present with us. Um, and absolutely, he tapped into this. Um, at the same time, um, you know, uh, he tapped into this, and he, I think he represented this for many, uh, for many, many uh, in, who encountered his work. At the same time, um, there were a handful of um, artists of uh, one generation older uh, to whom uh, he uh, looked uh, for models uh, uh, for uh, not just aesthetic models, but for models of ways of being uh, and ways of living, um, in particular in relation to a certain kind of a spiritual commitment. Um, Ledinch was not, did not identify as a, as a, as a religious individual at all, um, but his idol from fairly early on, one of his idols, and certainly late in life, was Arval Pert, uh, who uh, Ledinch was born in 1955 and Pert was born exactly 20 years earlier. Um, and uh, he was attracted to Pert's music, uh, but he was also attracted to the way that the music embodied a certain kind of commitment to living um, a life uh, that was um, uh, a deeply held belief from within, right? Because uh, Pert already at that time was, was writing music like the Mesa Syllabica that Ledinch arranged the, the premiere of. Um, was writing music that was um, you know, not just spiritual, but openly, openly Christian, right? It was a mass set to the full, full Latin text. Um, and uh, Valentin Silvestrov was another uh, that Leninch looked to. Um, I would say one other thing, though, about this is that, that he was, he had a certain kind of access, he, had, he enjoyed a certain sort of privilege, right? He was a, he was a, a son uh, from uh, an elite uh, family in, in the world, um, in the world in which he grew up. Um, as we saw early on in high school with the disciplinary actions, um, you know, he was able to do things uh, that many others could not. Uh, and he was able to leverage his ability to do things and to get away with things, to open spaces for others um, to experiment uh, in spaces that wouldn't have been available to them otherwise. So thank you for your answer. And before my, my other question, I, I also would like to uh, read the question put by Dominika Misal from Krakow. Uh, you said that Riga's disco scene was very rich. Was all of it similarly subversive? Was participating in those activities considered as some kind of social or even political manifestation? Yeah. Um... So Ledinch's disco, so um, uh, Riga, Ledinch, so let's see, um, Ledinch boasted in the later 1980s that uh, Riga's disco scene was um, un unsurpassed in the Soviet Union in terms of the number of discos that existed. Um, and, and there's some, there's some, you know, sort of at least circumstantial evidence for, um, for this. Um, yeah. There's a, a guy, uh, a historian, Sergei Zhuk, who wrote this book um, called Rock and Roll in the Rocket City, uh, and he grew up in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and the book is um, an archival study, but it's also part memoir of his own experience growing up going to discos um, in uh, sort of a, a medium-sized industrial city in, in Ukraine in uh, the late 1970s and early 1980s. And he writes about how um, when uh, the local uh, Komsomol or Soviet Youth League uh, wanted to set up a discotheque in, in the town, um, they, they brought some people down from Riga to kind of show them how to do it. Uh, is that, that's where the real expertise was. Um, and Ledinch was, was forefront in that scene. Um, that said, um, you know, Ledinch's uh, disco was absolutely, um, uh, I, I don't think it was necessarily typical of, of the disco experience in Riga. I mean, there were, there were, there were discos in, um, you know, factories had discos, you know, most of the schools had discos, there were the clubs, cultural centers, there were discos all over the place. And many of them were um, you know, straight up dancing uh, in, in this. And uh, you know, Ledinch was, um, I think, unusual in that he, the disco project was one manifestation of a broader and, and always deeply experimenting um, uh, artistic sensibility that he was really interested in, in, in you know, having dancing at his disco and getting as many people as he could. And he was interested in the sound and light show and all this sort of stuff. Um, but he was always thinking about what he could do more with it. Like he has people gathered. Um, what can he, what can he bring to their lives? Uh, he really kind of kept that educational mission of the early polytechnic disco with him, um, I think throughout. And that's, 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 I think is, is unusual. Um, and as for sub subversive content, I mean, um, 
you know, I, I, I don't really know. Um, it was the, the discos were, including Ledinger's discos, were, were supported um, and, um, and often celebrated uh, by, uh, by authorities. And he did, you know, sometimes boundaries were transgressed and then, um, and then he would be suspended in his operations for a while, like when he hosted the, the premiere of, of, of the Sacred Music in 1977. Um, he couldn't hold any more discos at the Polytechnic and he kind of stopped running any discos for a couple of years, but then he merged with his own disco two and a half years later and was allowed to proceed. So, um, you know, there was kind of this tension always between what was permissible and not. Um, and, and as I said before, certainly in his case, um, he, he seems to have been able to, um, to push those boundaries repeatedly. So thank you. And we have one more question from our online audiences. And I will read it because our uh, audience in the whole, uh, now we can, can see, yes. So Lisa Yakelsky, I am struck by the timbres of the instrument that were used for the, f on the Bolderaya style and later albums. Is there something about the sign, sound of this music that was also meant to contribute to their spiritual or ritual effect, or to help encourage listeners to perceive their surrounding in a different way? Yeah, um, I I don't I can't answer that definitively, but my my sense just as a as a listener and a student of this is that probably not um, in particular. Um, you know, the real scarce resource uh, in certainly in the late 1970s or you know the turn of the 1980s for um, uh, alternative musicians uh, it was the technology or the instruments. Um, you know, how people could acquire these things. And, and you know, again, Ledinch had some ties. His mother traveled regularly um, and, and did bring him some instruments and had other connections. And he actually, uh, by some accounts, became his, his, his home became something of a lending library of, of some of these instruments and, and tape recorders and so forth to other musicians um, in his scene. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, my sense of that, so in Boulder Eye style, the album recorded largely in 1980, um, they uh, are really using whatever they had on hand. Uh, and you can still hear um, the kind of detuned piano that uh, on some of the tracks, um, you know, there's a, a lot of percussion provided by Boyko, which is just um, you're hitting on empty bottles of, uh, uh, you know, glass bottles and so forth. It's really kind of a found object uh, project. Um, you know, they found a synthesizer pretty quickly and started using it. And then somewhere they got a drum machine. Um, they did connect uh, pretty early on in that flexi disc single um, with uh, another musician, Ingus Bauschenjeks, who was a, a, a student um, uh, also at the Polytechnic at the same time that Ledinch was. And Bauschenjeks, uh, at the same time, uh, was uh, founding one of the very first new wave bands uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, the Yellow Postmen or Zeltinia Pasnyaki. Um, and, uh, and he had also some equipment. He was a producer um, and really kind of helped them to, to develop a very polished style. Uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, you know, as soon as they, as soon as they could achieve that very polished style, they stuck with it. And, and that's really where they, uh, where they were, um, you know, from that point forward. So my sense is more that they used what they had on hand and that they were um, really, um, you know, seeking ways to make music that technically uh, was, um, uh, was something that was of, of a piece with what they were listening to. Um, and in Ledigen's case, it was, Laurie Anderson, Soft Cell, um, The Police, um, you know, bands, bands like this. Thank you. And I have one more question about networking. It seems to me that we uh, now have a growing interest in the experimentalism and networking inside Soviet Union. And uh, just, uh, for example, you and, uh, and also Peter Schmelz, who will lecture tomorrow, you are both developing the projects on networking and experimentalism. Mm -hmm. So, and in this context, I would be interested, to, um, I also would like to mention that uh, some shift of uh, uh, in interest uh, before it was West East and now we have East East, East or even Soviet Soviet East. What what was going in Soviet Union, and um, 
Speaking about this networking and collaborations uh, inside Soviet Union, you mentioned some Russian musicians and, and intellectuals as Boris Groys. What about Lithuanian, uh, Latvian-Lithuanian collaborations, if any, from that time? Yeah, you know, it, this is actually really interesting, and, and I would love to, to hear from, um, from you know, Lithuanian colleagues about you know, your sense of this too. Like my, my sense is that the Latvian scene um, uh, in this kind of a, you know, border between sort of art music and, and pop music, right? Uh, this kind of a scene, vernacular experimentalism, I guess, I think Ben Picot calls it, um, that I'm looking at with Ledinge is that it's a, it, we, people were really looking largely um, to, uh, to Moscow uh, for collaboration. And they were really looking largely to um, particularly uh, England or to um, West Germany for sound inspiration. Um, and, you know, Arvel Pert is sort of an exception. And, and I, I had a conversation with a, an Estonian colleague um, who was part of the disco, contemporaneous, contemporaneous disco um, underground kind of alternative music scene um, at uh, the uh, Tallinn uh, Polytechnic at the same time in the late 1970s. Uh, it was producing for them and recording you know, some of their, their activities. Um, and this is this past uh, uh, fall, uh, we got together and he was you know, sharing some of his recollections and he's like, I didn't know anything that was going on in, in Latvia. Um, and, you know, and Ledinch came to, to the, the, the festival um, in, in Tallinn in 1978. Um, which was a continuation of the festivals that, uh, that got him in trouble with the sacred music in Riga in 1977. Um, and he wasn't allowed to be an organizer, but he came and he was, he was like, he, he was the person who was putting these on in 1977. And it was his idea that Yubimov brought to Tallinn in 1978 for their very famous festival of early and contemporary music in November. Um, and, you know, by, by all accounts of people that, 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 I've, I've managed to connect with who attended the festival or who were involved with the festival in 78. It's like nobody even knew he was there. Um, he was sort of almost like a nobody um, there. And, and, you know, so I, I do wonder that, I, you know, I, I have wondered a lot. I and mean, of course we have some composers, I think Peters Vusks um, uh, studied in, in Lithuania, um, but it seemed to be more sort of, my, my, my impression is it's more sort of individuals here and there who maybe had some interest that, 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 that brought them um, into some connection or exchange, but not so much, um, uh, not so much a, certainly not an institutional connection or not, not so much of a, of a, of a community project, but I, I, I really don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, Ruta, if you have a sense of, of that. Uh, yes, thank you. Really, I think it's, it's really an uh, interesting question and interesting issue to uh, explore. Uh, because I remember some uh, articles in Lithuanian press by Oswaldas Bulakauskas from late uh, 70s when he, after uh, he studied at, at Kiev, mm -hmm. in a, at Kiev Conservatory, and then in late 70s he uh, visited some uh, uh, concerts or festivals in Latvia. He was excited and surprised what's going on in Latvia, uh, although Latvia was our neighbor. So, but yeah. I never. Uh, noticed any uh, collaborations between experimental and the ground scenes um, between Latvia and, and Lithuania, but probably we uh, have to uh, conduct some field work about that. Yeah. Do we have more questions? So we have one more question. Uh, I will read also. Will this topic be drawn out more? Book or further paper? Um, uh, yes, uh, a couple spots. Um, one, of course, is the will be the conference proceedings um, from this conference. Um, there will be uh, a, a version of part of it uh, in Latvian that will be published in um, Musica Saula. Um, it's an overlapping project, not, not exactly the same at all, but, but some overlap with some of the Ledinch material um, that will be at the end of this year. And then um, there are kind of bits and pieces of it here and there in um, a book uh, that I'm completing on Arval Pert and the uh, 1970s Soviet underground, uh, which will be published next year. Um, 
by the University of Chicago Press. So there, there are pieces of it here and there, but, but, the, but this, the, the whole project will be in the, the conference proceedings. And in addition, I have to add that uh, we are preparing several, several publications. Uh, one uh, publication will be volume of selected papers uh, will be published by Academic Press uh, in Boston. And uh, we will publish some papers on our uh, uh, journal, Lutheran Musicology, which is also available online. And one more uh, mm, publication from our joint uh, Lutheran Polish project will be published by Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Mm -hmm. so, so again, I would like to thank Kevin and all of you, everybody, everyone who joined us for uh, this really intensive first conference day. Uh, here, uh, who yeah. are uh, attending our conference uh, in person, we will have a live music concert. What is in pandemic situation is real pleasure. We will have uh, now very um, demanded uh, jazz group, the Schwand, the Schwings Band. We will play jazz for us. So, and I hope to see our online audiences tomorrow uh, here in, in this uh, rooms. And uh, we will start at 11 Vilnius time and we'll uh, conclude uh, next day by one more keynote lecture by Peter Schmelz on uh, Ganellin Trio in United States. So thank you very much uh, and bye-bye uh, until tomorrow. Thank you.